Thank you. Good morning. We will call this Douglas County Board of Commissioners um, work session to order. Today is Monday, April 20th, 2020. Um, First of all, I would like if you could please mute your phone if you're not in the, um, if you're not speaking, and also we only have an opportunity for four uh, people to be on the camera at one time. So I ask that you turn your camera off if you're not speaking. Uh, with that being said, uh, I would move to public comment. Uh, to uh, first of all, I would like to say to the citizens of Douglas County, this meeting is being held uh, under the. Um, Open Meetings Act, and we are under emergency uh, orders. And uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to take your public comments today. However, I encourage you to please email your concerns to your individual district commissioners or Mark Teal or myself. Uh, please uh, feel free to email your concerns to us, and we will respond to you and take this matter under advisement immediately. Order commissioners to uh, First of all, welcome, Board of Commissioners, and also to the citizens of Douglas County. Thank you so much for joining our virtual meeting. Again, this is we are uh, in our fourth week of this COVID-19 situation, and I hope and pray that everyone is doing fine or uh, doing great amidst this uh, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, approval of the minutes, Board of Commissioners, please be prepared to approve the minutes accordingly tomorrow uh, at 6 p.m. at our 6 p.m. work uh, at our 6 p.m. Board of Commissioners meeting. I'm going to move around just a little bit so I could expedite uh, the meeting. Uh, Board of Commissioners, I ask uh, when we get to our presentations, if you could just uh, wait until the presentations, each presentation is completed, and then uh, please, you feel free to ask questions. Um, I ask that we limit our questions uh, to three minutes, and then also responses if you have a response to a two-minute time frame. Thank you so much. I'm going to move uh, just a little bit around. I want to move to the business item today, which is tab number seven, and is authorization for the chairman to sign the fiscal designation form for the Family Connection Partnership Grant Douglas Core. Is uh, Director King on uh, today? Jennifer King? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Can you explain to the Board of Commissioners what this is, please? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is the annual registration where we sign off that we are continuing to be the fiscal agent for core for the state okay any any questions from the board madam any chair questions? yes vice, chair. vice chairman robinson yes thank you madam chair um uh, madam king question for you for, for the public sake it is it's, it's been some time so what is core and what is its function? As a matter of fact, I was in a, a, a conversation recently regarding its function here locally. So can you just back up? Because I don't want to let it be marginalized by the fact that assuming everybody understands what this is. As you know, a lot of people are beginning to watch these meetings because of us sheltering in place. So while historically the people who typically were active were, were a handful, there's a lot more people involved. So can you just take a little bit of time explaining what core is? Because I think it's important. Yes. Um, CORE is our county family connections group. Um, they work to kind of identify local resources. They meet once a month um, throughout the year to do kind of specific presentations as far as different community resources and partners in Douglas County um, to talk about, you know, what's out there, what are some new things, what are things that are working, or if they're not working, what can we do to um, kind of assist with that. Okay, my, so let me extend that a little bit further. So one of the, the deliverables, um, and, and just correct me if I, if I missed this, one of the deliverables is what I call the community resource guide. And it was something that was published that became an invaluable, it's like a pamphlet, a booklet in essence, but it was an aggregation of all resources um, in the county for one place for, for citizens to go, for everything from mental health to this, that, I mean, Again, one more time, what, what is it that you're talking about resource? What does that mean? Um, well, honestly, Commissioner, um, you know, at this time, I'm, I'm not completely sure what all they are organizing as far as resources. The resource guide that you're talking about was actually created here in my office in juvenile programs. Okay. Um, Ms. Hobson does that yearly and updates that, has a resource fair every year um, to put that together. Um, so I can't really 
say today what CORE is doing as far as the resources. I am not involved in that level with them. Um, all we are doing at this point is the, the fiscal agent piece. All right, so then last question then, you're the fiscal agent. You're the fiscal agency. What, you're just overseeing the budget? and, and um, So what does that mean for the public's sake? So you're the fiscal um, agent. The only thing that we're required as fiscal agent to do is um, we accept their statements. They send in their statements every month um, here in my office to Ms. Hobson. And then she submits the reports for the processing of their payment from the state. We're not involved with any decision making. Um, and that is very clear in all the paperwork and the contracts that were prepared that basically all we're doing is processing that um, for them. Right, so I'm, I'm hearing us and them. So who is CORE, who runs the day-to-day, -day, and is there oversight? Is there a directorship? I mean, I'm, 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 I mean, we're talking about it at arm's length, but I'm like, okay, but why are we doing this? And who are they? Can you tell us that? Um, Amanda Bryant is the executive director. Um, there is a board that runs CORE, controls CORE, and then they answer to a state representative person. Um, as far as I know, that's that's really all that I'm aware of. Right. There is no oversight here from my office other than the the financial processing. Okay. All right. Madam Chair, I yield. Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions from the board before I move on? Um, thank you so much, um, um, Director King. I know that the Corps accomplishes the mission through its partners by in identifying the community needs, strengths, and missions and then choosing priorities and sharing experience, knowledge, and resources to plan solutions, and collaborating um, to raise grant funds and coordinating existing resources around a uh, common, uh, common agenda. So the purpose has certainly um, uh, been here in Douglas County quite a while. CORE has been here. So thank you again for just bringing this information to the Board of Commissioners this morning. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Board of Commissioners, I'm going to move on to tab number eight, authorization to amend the Douglas Corps to reflect the reversal of the FY uh, budget cut from the state and revert back to the original service contract between Douglas County and Corps approved July 9th, uh, 2019, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and amend the budget. Jennifer King. Yes, ma'am. This... Um when we amended the contact contract, excuse me, they were cut. Um, I believe it was two thousand dollars from fifty thousand down to forty eight, and now the state is just giving them the two thousand back. So it would just amend back up to fifty thousand dollars. Okay, pretty self-explanatory. Any questions from the board? All right, thank you so much, uh, Director King. Thank, thank you. you. I'm gonna move on to tab number nine. Tab number nine is authorization to accept supplemental funds and emergency COVID-19 funds in the amount of $15,283 from the CJCC for the DUI Accountability Court and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and amend the budget. Anita Granger, Mrs. Granger. Are you Good on? morning. Good morning, Commissioner. How are you? Good morning. Good to see you. <laughs> Um, so these are two um, supplemental um, grants that we had an opportunity to apply for. They, they come up rather quickly in the, um, we're, we are now in the fourth quarter of our current grant year. And so um, as I saw that there was a need for some additional monies for drug testing, um, due to the COVID, we're doing things a little bit differently. So um, we, um, asked for those supplemental funds and they granted them to us. So I've got two different ones. Um, one is in the amount of $8,845. The other one is in the amount of $6,438 and the total was listed on the um, agenda. So I just ask that you um, allow us to accept these funds. There are no matches, um, you just have to prepay and then they will reimburse the county for the, for the expenditures. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Granger. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? All yes, right. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Guider. Anita, uh, now this is for um, the COVID-19. Uh, so, this is to reimburse you for additional testing. Is that what you're saying? The, 
Well, well what, what we're doing with the COVID funds is we're getting um, portable breathalyzers for the people that are in the DUI court so they don't have to come in for testing. They can test at a home for the alcohol consumption. So that that's what the COVID one is. The other um, supplemental grant is just for our regular um, urine screening and whatever other kind of screening that we do. We, we've been pat using patches. We've been having to do some stuff to, to keep our contact down. Obviously, we still have to have contact with folks. We are still running the accountability court. Um, and so we are still having some contact with people. Um, but mostly we're trying to do things via video, like groups and individual sessions, stuff like that. So um, the COVID funds, again, they were for me to be able to get some um, breathalyzers to um, put in people's homes. To reduce the contact because of the virus. Yes, ma'am. So uh, I assume that this these funds will go against any uh, additional rev, uh, expenditures that the county will incur because of the COVID virus. Yeah, I, 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 I would I'm asking the chairman, I guess, because <laughs> I, I, I don't guess you would know that, uh, Anita, but uh, I was just wondering, so this would go in that special fund This to this is offset. Not yeah, this is not something that I will claim, you know, with the what you the Board of Commissioners has asked us to tell you what our extra expenses are because I'm having getting state funds. I wouldn't put this on that spreadsheet because it's going to be reimbursed by the state. OK, uh, well, it's a bookkeeping thing, but uh, the money in money out, so to speak. So yep. uh, I'll leave that up to. Uh, Jennifer Hallman, who is keeping track of all the COVID extra expenses due to the COVID virus. So thank you, Anita. Thank you, Ms. Guider. Thank you. You yield you, back, Commissioner Guider, I'm assuming. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Anita. You're welcome. Right. Have a good day. All right. All right. Board of Commissioners, we're going to move on to tab. Yes. Chair. yes. May I ask a question? Yes, I yeah. hear. Yeah. To, to Madam Guy, to, to Madam Guider's point, is there any way we could, County Administrator, can you speak to what was the instructions to the full organization in keeping up with these expenses? I'm always concerned when we have off balance sheet um, accounting. Uh, that, that that becomes an issue for me. That says it raises an eyebrow. Like, wait a minute, what now? Uh, it, there, there, it can't be discretionary what we're going to report and not report. We need a full understanding of expenses that are part of this or revenues. Um, else, if we get partial information, then I, I think that's misleading, uh, both to the Board of Commissioners and I don't think it's intentional. But when I hear comments that, well, we're not going to report, well, what were the instructions and how do we reconcile that? Because we need a full picture. What were the revenues and what were the expenses for this once in a lifetime? We, we need to monitor this. We need the data. Uh, and so uh, it, it's not to... Um, usurp um, the need for um, obviously anybody in their respective agencies to do their job but we're we're the ones accountable for the money and so um, county administrator can you speak to that to that and how and director Hall, we don't have to belabor this we can pick this up in finance um later today in the finance committee but i i want to be clear let's not do that okay i understand what you're saying commissioner robinson and i will make sure that these expenses are on the sheet um i just wanted to make sure that you all knew that they were going to be reimbursed through other sources so thank that's you. not a problem absolutely thank you for clarifying that thank i appreciate you. it and yes commissioner robinson all departments are tracking um their expenses that are related to the covid 19. and i think what anita was saying these funds are directly coming from the state so it's not expenses that we're, I mean, we're definitely getting reimbursed for these through a separate grant. I see. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm out. Okay. Thank you. All right. Ma Madam Chair. Oh. Yes, Commissioner Guyton. Claire, uh, we will be getting several grants from different, from the state agencies, from the federal agencies or whatever, and they need to be tracked because we're probably having to uh, fund the items up front and then get reimbursed on the back end. But mm -hmm. we need to clarify that everything, whether it's going to be 100% reimbursed, reimbursed, 
reversible from the state or whoever that we still have to show that because we're we're fun, we're funding it up front we will receive the reimbursement on the back end money in money out <laughs> I, and i yield back we'll see okay Thank you, uh, Commissioner Guy. I appreciate your statement. Money in, money out. We are tracking that. Mark is doing, and, and uh, the finance team is doing a, uh, a fantastic job so far. They have some uh, the the ledger. They are keeping up with the information. Mark, if you just want to respond to how we are tracking, I know you've reported some out. Could you just respond how we're how we're tracking at this point? Thank you. Yes. So we've sent out a uh, spreadsheet to all departments and they are tracking all their expenses on that spreadsheet um so to date as of well i guess as of about a week ago last tuesday um all the departments submitted their expenses and it's included on the finance committee report today and we continue to track those awesome i hope that yeah, answers no the question from the 2009 flood uh the hurricanes the tornadoes um it's business as usual as far as tracking these expenses. Okay. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Commissioner Guider. We are doing a great job. We have a two o'clock finance meeting. Again, I, um, I certainly provided access for any commissioner that wanted to join in or our citizens just to look at the, our, um, to just take a sneak peek at what we're doing in terms of uh, our finance. We're looking at a recovery, a, a revenue recovery plan and expense reduction plan. So I uh, welcome you to, to join our two o'clock finance meeting today. Thank you. I'm going to move on to tab number seven. Uh, I'm sorry, tab number six. And tab number six is one of our resolutions. And I, I believe our uh, tax assessor, Mr. Ben, uh, Director Waldroff is on the phone. Is, uh, tab number six is authorization to approve a resolution approving the waiver of certain penalties and interest by the Douglas County Tax Commissioner and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, thank you, Director Waldroff, for taking a look at this uh, information that I had sent over uh, through Mark to see what your uh, thoughts were, and I appreciate you developing a resolution. Um, Director Waldroff, Benny, are you here? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Oh, okay, could you please explain to the Board of Commissioners what this resolution is and the purpose of it? What this does is give the waive the interest and penalties that the tax commissioner would be required by law to uh, place on late taxpayers for the days of March 21st through June the 1st. If it's if before, if it opens up before that, it'll be the opening day. It'll free the, it'll give the tax commissioner authority to waive those late, late charges and penalties he has to assess. And also give him a, a leeway to uh, uh, not put a 10% penalty on personal property returns and relate because they couldn't be properly uh, submitted because the, the office was closed to the public and still closed to the public until whatever time the board of commissioners opens it back up. Okay. So it's just to, it's just to uh, all of the counties in the state of Georgia will probably will do this. This is uh, also suggested by the Department of Revenue to give the taxpayers a break because they couldn't properly submit their personal property reporting forms. They couldn't properly pay their taxes from the time the tax commission has been closed and until right now we're still closed. So this would be the leeway to give some property tax credit. Madam Chair, this is Ken Bernard. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, that the form submitted I've reviewed and also it's been reviewed by ACCG. It is a form similar to the one being passed around the state and what Benny has said is correct. Okay, thank you so much, Attorney Bernard. Thank you so much. Um, Board of Commissioners, any questions regarding the solution? Yes. Uh-huh. Vice Chairman Robinson, I hear yes. you. I don't yes, see you. that's fine. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Quick question for you, Benny, and uh, I acknowledge the fact what the state is doing, and obviously um, every dime helps our community, uh, obviously uh, the citizens. I've, I've got a, an operational question, which is dealing with the digest in general. And um, obviously we just had this conversation, so it's just a repeat what you shared with me is, well, where do we stand with our digest? I, I recognize 
penalties and things what we, we what we will impose upon the citizens if, if if in fact they're late or not late or whatever. But how do we stand operationally and being able to do our digest? And I, you know, what is our timeline? Are we on track? I mean, it's been a while since we really talked about it. I'm not looking for anything uh, specifically, but just awareness that says, okay, here we are going to almost May. And where do we stand on our normal operate? Are we business as usual? We're sticking to our same timeline or did we make adjustments? And I'll leave it at that. That's all I want to look and I'll yield the floor. Thanks, Benny. We're trying to continue on the same timeline. The assessment notice is out by July the 1st. That uh, just submitted to the state by September 1st. The state's given us all kinds of extra leeway that they're not changing the law for. But uh, as far as no late penalties, we were had to be late. But I think right now we're on pretty much on track. We got a uh, Auburn new construction entered. Uh, Personal property may be lagging a little bit behind and have to do a good many NODs, but as far as uh, everything else, it looks like we're going to be on track. I yield, I'm sure. Okay, thank you so much, Vice Chairman Robinson. Any questions? Any other questions from the Board of Commissioners? Thank you so much, um, Director Waldrop, for bringing this information. Certainly, we want to give considerations to every citizen in Douglas County. And that's what this uh, Board of Commissioners is, uh, this is what we made up. We're putting uh, service before self. We want to make sure we give consideration to every citizen here in Douglas County during this very uh, unprecedented time. So thank you for working on that and, and, and generating the resolution so quickly. Thank you, uh, uh, Attorney Bernard, for working on this as well. All right, uh, move on to Board of Commissioners, I encourage you tomorrow to look at your uh, look at your expenses, and please be prepared to approve accordingly tomorrow. And then, we, uh, if there's no other comment at this particular time, I'm gonna move into presentations. We have three presentations this morning, and I wanted to allow our speakers at least a 10 minute time frame so they could speak and and provide a good detail. Uh, presentation and then we'll move on with questions. I'm going to start this morning with our SPLOST update by Terry Gable. Uh, Mr. Gable, are you on the phone? I am, Madam Chair. Okay, would you please kick off with our first presentation this morning? Appreciate you being here. Yes, ma'am. Um, so let me, I'm going to share um, um, screen here and put the PowerPoint up. Okay. Um, uh, good morning again. Uh, it's Terry Gable with Atlas, and we'll be doing uh, the April update uh, on the SPLOS program. Hope everyone can see the uh, the PowerPoint. Um, so the 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 revenues that we're reporting on this month will be the February revenues, 2020 February revenues. It'll be the work uh, that has been accomplished through uh, March. So we have one month left. Uh, left in uh, year three. Uh, once we m get the revenues in for March, um, we're actually in April. That's the beginning of SPLOS year four to give your perspective on kind of where we're at in the overall program. Um, and in saying that, before I get into some um, revenue updates and um, project updates, so we are moving very cautiously as we move into SPLOS year four due to the COVID impacts, obviously, and we'll be looking at different models of some reductions in revenues, um, looking at some impacts to projects just to try to keep uh, heads up on uh, what may occur as we move through SPLOS year four. But in saying that, uh, I'll jump into the revenues. So we we did um, uh, uh, invoices paid out in, uh, last, last month in March did drop some. We paid out about a half million dollars in um, in March, work through March. So we're up around, we're approaching that $40 million mark as to what's been invoiced in the program. Uh, majority of that was, um, of the half million dollars that was invoiced out was done in the parks program. Um, and it'll continue to pick up with the, with the construction projects that we were underway with. Uh, the In looking at the collections for February, this. We're still pretty solid with that. We didn't obviously come above the bar, 
uh, that being a, represented, a representation of the projections. Uh, we were slightly under it, but we'll certainly take that with uh, the environment that we're in right now. We we're about $70,000 under projections, uh, but still, um, like I said, still being fairly stable with, uh, with a dollar amount versus the projections. So the February came in at 1.9 million. Um, the for the total of splash year three, we're at roughly 24.4 million dollars. So we're still looking at uh, around two million dollars that were over projections for splash year three. And then if you look at the overall program, splash years one, two, and three, uh, we're approximately 73.8 million dollars for total revenues that have been collected. And if you compare that to projections, uh, we're about $3.2 million over. So no really changes there uh, as of today with our revenues. Uh, looking at the bond servicing and payment obligations, uh, we paid the, the large payment of $18.9 million April 1st. Uh, the collections were actually uh, made uh, uh, with the December uh, 2019 collections where we actually had enough revenues at that point to to make the bond payment but they're set up um, to make that last payment April 1st so we're solid there the bond payment's been made for splash year three and as we move into splash year four I'll start reporting on um, the uh, the amount that's going to be due in splash year four it'll be slightly little slightly less than splash year three and then after that, we got one, one more smaller payment compared to the much smaller compared to these. Um, and then we'd be done with the uh, uh, the paybacks on the bond. So with that, I'll get into uh, some project updates, kind of get you guys up to where we're currently at. Uh, the county ride, countywide digital radio system. Uh, we did cut over to the or moved over to the new system uh, in March, the middle of March. Um, Chief's given some good reports on that just from from just period use, usage of the system. I think they're very happy with it. Um, as you remember, the board did at the beginning of the month, they approved a revised complete a completion date for uh, the radio system from April 30th to June 30th, uh, primarily due to COVID-19 impacts. So they needed a little bit more time uh, and that really was centered around the technical testing that's going to begin uh, the 1st of May for the overall system and will pr primarily run through most of May. Uh, once they get that completed, and it should put us in June and um, have a few the, June to kind of wrap the whole program up and turn it over uh, to the county. So good news there. Hopefully by the end of, uh, of June, we'll have a complete system and uh, be up and running 100% with great coverage. The the ambulance, the 2020 ambulance uh, for SPLOS, uh, the chief had two for um, for SPLOS tier four. And as I said, we are moving uh, forward cautiously with, with new things that we're ordering. The chief's ready to put those on the street. Uh, at this point, we're going to, uh, we're looking at maybe holding, holding off on that for another month or two. And if we do put it out, we'll put it out with an option in there of possibly only purchasing one ambulance this year. But we are looking at that um, at this point. Um, the next thing is fire truck, uh, fire uh, fire engine for 2019. Uh, you know, I had reported on that. This is last year's actually uh, Splash Year Three's fire truck. Uh, it does take several months to get these fabricated from scratch, uh, but we are expecting it's on schedule. We're expecting it to be completed and chief take delivery of that uh, next month. And so we do have one fire truck that's in um, uh, Splash Year 4. The, uh, the bids were received on March uh, 31st, and the, the chief will, have a, uh, will make a recommendation to the uh, fire committee May 5th on accepting one of the bids for the fire truck for 2020. The last project I'll report on in uh, for the fire department is station 11. Chief is, this project is being funded uh, out of the chief's uh, fire station renovations. Uh, this will be a critical project for them. It's, it's off state right 92, just north of, of Douglasville. 
Uh, it's improved, mostly site improvements to improve access, uh, fire truck access to the rear of the, uh, the fire station or the bays. It'll be enlarging the parking lot and the driveway. We'll be making some site improvements uh, for that and also doing uh, another critical role will be to rep upgrade the uh, septic system for the fire station that's um, badly needed. We've already contracted with a design team for that. It was Southeast Civil Group. Uh, they they are located here in Douglasville, which is, is good for the program. And they, they already are working on two of our projects and we've had good luck with Southeast Civil Group. Look forward to um, to finishing or getting this project underway. They've started the preliminary survey and, and design on it. And we'll be working with them through the summer to get, get this project up and, and bid out for construction. And with that, I'll move into, into the transportation program. The resurfacing program for 2020, we did uh, lower the SPLOS dollars for 2020. Uh, we decided to provide the match for the LMIG grant, the state LMIG grant. So we're looking at roughly about a $2 million resurfacing program for 2020. Uh, part of this work will be bid out to the private industry for the doing the milling and the patching. Uh, and then we'll be doing the resurfacing to be done in-house with Douglas County's maintenance department. So we're looking forward to getting that started. Uh, they expect uh, the bids to be turned in uh, in uh, early May for the milling and patching. Obviously, that's the first thing that's going to need to be done uh, to get to the resurfacing stage. So we'll move into some of the intersections. Um, Stewart Mill Road at Reynolds Road. This is in the in the right of way phase. Miguel staff has several projects now that they that are in the right of way phase and they're working uh, aggressively to try to get these. There's about nine parcels for Stewart Mill that'll have to be acquired. And as soon as he gets those, the plans are ready and we'll be able to get this project bid out for construction. Right start John West Road. Um, this project, the bids were accepted May, uh, March 19th. Uh, we had several bidders to um, submit a bid, which is always good to get more bidders. Uh, Miguel will be, Miguel's staff will be presenting uh, a recommendation for um, an award on that to the, to the committee this week. So this will be another project that will get under construction uh, late spring, early summer here shortly. And then Sweetwater Church Road at Doris Road is under construction by Summit. Uh, they're on schedule. Uh, they've been up, been up there several times, uh, mo mostly grading and drainage work going on. Um, but you can just tell by riding through there just how tight that intersection was. And um, it's, it's very difficult for the for the contractor to even get in and do the work. but. Hopefully when they get done with this, it'll be a much, much improved intersection uh, for the traveling public. Chapel Hill Road uh, is our uh, turn lane project uh, on Chapel Hill, just south of I-20, uh, a much needed project that's still in the de design phase. And Miguel continues to work with uh, the design team and in, in, in getting some numbers on, on we've talked about for a few weeks or months now here about uh, looking at a, a five lane section that's in the um, long range transportation plan plan for Douglas County anyway just looking at some cost numbers and making a decision uh, the board making it providing the board with enough information to make a decision on whether we want to uh, use that template or just stay with a, a three lane section so once we get that decision finalized, the design team can move forward with finalizing their plans and getting Miguel uh, the right of way plans. So continue on very active project uh, that's still underway. Highway 5 at Douglas Boulevard. Uh, this is being designed by Michael Baker. This is our right turn lane uh, on Highway 5 onto Douglas Boulevard. They have um, they've got an original they've got a concept a preliminary concept developed uh, so we we're steadily working on that. Looks like the turn lane, Miguel said, is going to be a little bit longer than what we anticipated, which that means it's just that much of a queue at that intersection, and it's needed. Um, first thing they're trying to get established, and that's that's, in a, it's a, ma a main factor right now is is location of all the underground utilities and aerial, because this will impact the the amount could impact the amount of right of way that they've got established for the for the turn lane. Uh, and would and get that worked out with GDOT. So 
it's well underway, but we, we're in the early design stages of it and hopefully be making some good progress with it over the next couple, two or three weeks. Post Road Bridge over Dog River. This project is on schedule. Um, it's, it's, and we've been reporting on it to be uh, the contractor being here uh, in the fall. Uh, no change in that. And we'll be looking forward to getting him started uh, uh, September, October of this year and getting that critical bridge replaced on Post Road. There are sidewalk projects. The, the, the sidewalk at Lithia Springs Elementary School and the Chestnut Log uh, Middle School, Miguel has it, he is working on the contract documents to get it in, uh, get it into advertisement for construction. So we'll be looking forward to getting these two projects underway uh, this spring or, or this summer. The new Manchester High uh, sidewalk, as we've been reporting, uh, obviously is located on a state route. Um, so that's with, in partnership with GDOT, not only on the permit to be able to do the work, but also uh, Miguel is trying to get the uh, speed reduction approved for that corridor, uh, not only for the safety of the, of, the, of the students out there, but it really is becoming critical. We are finding out for the crosswalk and being able to have a protected crosswalk. Uh, we got, we got to, we're hopefully are going to be successful in getting that speed limit reduced out there so we can have a protected crosswalk with the kids across over 92 to the high school. So it's underway and we're, we're certainly on top of it and working with the design team to get this project moving as soon as we get uh, everything GDOT needs for the permit and for the, the speed reduction. Uh, Whitestone culvert, do you remember, is, is under construction with Corbett construction. Uh, we did have to delay them some with, with the schedule uh, to do a redesign on the footing, which is uh, in a way good news for Douglas County. It, it is reducing the construction cost on the project, which is good news. But on the flip side, it has delayed the project some. But we still think it'll be completed on time, on schedule. Uh, we just need to get Miguel's work and get everything finalized with the paperwork and the documents. Uh, in order to get the contractor back in and go to work. So we're looking forward to that um, and getting that project back cranked up in construction. Our street lights are, are moving. Um, as, as the board has seen, we've had three of the five interchanges um, have been, um, we're working through the process of getting an MOU with GDOT, which has to be done before the work starts. Uh, two of them already uh, approved by the board. And there's, I noticed another one is on the agenda for for this month to be approved. Uh, and that'll leave us two interchanges that, that we'll need to do the same or follow the same format with. I do believe one of them, well, the other two may be, um, well, the other one of one is post road, so it won't have to have a, a, an MOU with GDOT. Um, but it is moving forward, which is good news. So um, that work will be starting soon, hopefully uh, early, like again, late spring, early summer. Um, our State Route 92 project at Mount Vernon, a critical intersection that we've been um, we've been monitoring very closely. Police Department has we hit, we did get the contractor did get started in March, and uh, all we're doing is putting a signal up here, so it's going very quickly. Um, the uh, at least the schools were out, um, and it gave them an opportunity to get in there and and get the get the poles up, and you you can see that the signals are signal heads are up. The only thing uh, left to do there uh, is to get the control panel in and get the power on. And I'm sure that's gonna follow here very promptly. Uh, and we'll have this, hopefully have the, uh, the heads up and flashing and do the 30 day burn and, and they'll have this up and running within the next month or so. So good news there and get the signal in at a, a much needed intersection. The Highway 92 at Riverside Parkway. Uh, we've got uh, a design team looking at this intersection. Miguel is keeping us updated. Apparently, GDOT is also looking at this this intersection uh, for one of their quick response projects. The same thing they did at, not at Mount Vernon. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that's going to move forward, uh, and and GDOT will come in and do a signal there, and then uh, get that project under construction. I don't think there's been anything confirmed there yet, but we're waiting on uh, waiting on some final decisions from GDOT before anything else is decided. As to what improvements we'll we'll be doing at this at this intersection. Lee Road widening project. 
is is on schedule still to to have this project ready to advertise by June. Um, Miguel's re reported to us that the design is pretty much complete. This is Michael Baker again. Uh, they just got to go through the review process with GDOT. And we again, we're getting lined up to get this project advertised late May or early June. Our Maxim Road project um, from the Thornton Road intersection, this is a GDOT project up to the Cobb County line is, is under design by Low Engineering. Uh, it should be a fairly uh, quick project. Miguel's saying that we, odds are at this point, we will not have to get any additional right away, which is always a plus. Even easements can become critical, can slow the project down considerably. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll be good there with the right of way and this project will be up and running uh, as far as construction uh, this summer once the design is completed. And with that, um, I'll move into our parks program project updates, uh, which is primarily boiled down to um, the project that we have ongoing this summer, all of them being advertised and are under construction. Our Deer Lake Park tennis court projects uh, and new lighting. Um, I've got some pictures here of each one. Um, there's been a good bit of work done out there. We did, uh, we were, we had anticipated hitting rock at this site. Uh, we knew it was there, didn't know the extent of it, but we did end up having to raise the tennis courts. But what you're looking at there is, is um, the, uh, we're at grade for the tennis court pads. So there has been a good bit uh, of work done. We had to raise it approximately 12 inches to keep to stay out of the mass bulk of the rock there. And you, um, what this was taken last week, we've got what you see in the foreground there is um, the footings have been poured and they're getting ready to pour the slab for the, the center building, which is really just a small pavilion and some bathrooms that are in tennis courts will be on each side of it. Uh, so it's, it's moving. They're working to get the, the uh, underground utilities in, uh, weather permitting. And you can see in the background that pile back there is it was a lot of rock and that that mainly primarily came from uh, installing the uh, drainage pipe. So, but we're working through that and making making a good bit of progress considering the um, uh, the rock that we we, re we encountered. Um, our multi-purpose rec center uh, started work in March. Uh, that's Ray Lynn out of uh, Carrollton. They're making good progress. They they did get out. They got the they got the site set up, the construction trailers out there, they got it cleared. Um, one thing that's a little, is, has been a little tricky with the weather is we've got to bring in uh, fill dirt with this project. In order to do that, we've got we, we've got to get that, the, the, the grade they're sitting on right, they've got to get that stabilized. And we have had, we have had some issues with weather, uh, with all the rain we've had this winter and some, some unsuitable soil. So we're working through that and trying to get the ground stabilized so we can start bringing uh, some structural fill in to get up to grade and start the footings and the slab for the building. So they're working uh, as best they can and, and working through the, the some challenges early on, which is not unusual uh, for vertical construction. Uh, the senior center uh, in Lithia Springs started and also started in March. Um, they have, uh, at the timing of it, we had some issues early on with the, the, uh, the same thing with the rec center here, but we didn't have to bring in all the fill. So once we got this area stabilized, uh, they they hit the ground running. As you can see, you look, that is just about the full uh, slab uh, area for the entire building. And if you can, in the to the left of the slide there is the pool. So uh, they uh, Headley has made good progress there out in Union. They're doing a good job so far um, in getting that site dry in and, and being able to get the actually get the footings poured and get the slab poured. The slab would, was poured as early as last week. So a good job to them considering the weather that we've been having uh, and they'll be bringing in the next thing that'll be going up here will actually be the uh, some of the parking lot area and the, the trusses for the building itself. So good job there and we're making again making good progress based on the uh, inclement weather that we've had. And then the, the last two projects that I'll report on in parks uh, are the is our concession buildings, new concession buildings at Bill Art Park and Fair Play Park. These were bid out um, 
at the same time, uh, Prime Construction has got the contracts. They have started. They've got a work order to start. Uh, they started work on first thing we have to do is demo those buildings. They started that last week, and they'll be progressing with the, with this project as we move into April uh, and into some drier weather, hopefully. And with that, Madam Chair, uh, that concludes the presentation, and okay. I will I will open it up uh, for questions for the board. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Gable. Board of Commissioners, do we have any questions for Mr. Gable? Madam Chair. Okay, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I'll be as tight as I can. Terry, let's back up to your opening statements regarding the SPLOS uh, revenues. You guys have done a great job overall in managing this SPLOS. I, I want to give credit. Um, uh, I've been able to witness two, two SPLOS go down. Uh, one was a single building, uh, but to watch you guys oversee this has been commendable, and I do appreciate staff. I mean, we had a chance to step back for a minute uh, over the past couple of months, and we have to, to appreciate the swiftness and just the efficiency, and a, a lot has gone on. And I, I know sometimes we're caught up in the day-to-day -day and the pressures, but you guys have done an excellent job. Uh, and, and so I, I want to, you know, you as well as the directors, uh, as well as the county administrator, you guys rock this thing. Uh, and again, to, to now, now is one of those, okay, let's just finish it. All right, so um, I think that the public has been long in waiting for something for them. Um, you know, again, while we appreciate uh, administrative buildings, uh, every now and then it's like, well, what about me? And I think this loss and the details associated was very sensitive. It was very inclusive. And I don't want that to fall uh, to deaf ears. All right, so let me get into the revenues. So. Our revenues are rolling along um, um, as of February. Uh, we were solid. Um, I know in February I, I asked for a, at least a a recast, a reforecast of things. Uh, I know I re-emphasized it in March. Um, do we anticipate that that reforecast will be presented during the finance committee today? Um, because that's what they ask. I'm just again, it's been a while since we all talked, but please confirm for me that that's going to be presented or it's going to be incorporated. Mark, I may let you chime in there, but we, I've been, the, the SPLOS team has been working with, with Mark um, and, and Jennifer. We do have uh, some numbers that we've been looking at. Um, okay. They've been reviewed by both Mark and Jennifer. Uh, Mark, I'll, if, if that was, if the plan was to present those today. Um, no, not today. We've looked at them, but we're not 100% um, comfortable with the numbers. So we don't want to provide you any data that's incorrect, but we're getting very close. Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll I'll, I'll table that comment. Just Jennifer, Director Hallman, just make a note that during our miscellaneous comments uh, that we'll cover this. Um, again, if we're looking at our operational costs, we need to look at our capital costs. Uh, and so I know we're going through this exercise, but they must be aligned. They, they can't be unaligned. So let it go. I got to keep moving them on time. Duly noted. All right, moving on. Uh, next topic, um, uh, let's talk about uh, Miguel Regional Alignment. Uh, the Lee Roll project, which is important, it covers three districts. Uh, it's not all concentrated in District 2, though the widening was. Can you talk about that? I mean, are we still going to go forward with that project? The state is live, assuming all things being equal. And I heard Terry, but I want to hear you say it, validate it, that we're moving forward with that um, project. Yes, Commissioner, uh, that that project is on schedule and um, it will be ready to go to uh, bid in late May or early June. And as of this point, everything is moving along. Yeah. So we, we have a plan and we don't have to get into the capital um, uh, or the comprehensive transportation plan. We'll cover that during the transportation committee tomorrow. But Terry did highlight like these intersections along 92. I mean, we talked about Mount Vernon. Uh, we talked about obviously Riverside. Um, obviously, you've got the Anoake, and, and then obviously, of lately, based on my town hall, but, uh, there's the 166 that, that sort of dead ends into Fairburn. Uh, all of these are, you know, what I want to call what east west, and they're dumping into this major artery. And again, it, it, it appears that we've outgrown our infrastructure, and we're, we're doing a lot of left turns, right? We're doing things that wasn't anticipated in times past. Um, do we think this will get us there? 
Uh, because again, it's already in play. Uh, is this more of a, just a short term play or is there a better solution? And you don't have to go long on this. I just want to mark it. Yes, uh, I think the improvements to those intersections will cover us for, for quite a while. Uh, certainly with uh, changes in transportation patterns, circulation and volume, uh, there's going to be other things that we need to look at and, and improvements to be made in the future. But what we're looking at at both Riverside, Anawake, and uh, obviously Mount Vernon it will carry us for quite a while. I would say a good 10 years or so. Yep. Very good. Very good. All right. And that brings me to my last comment, and uh, which deals with specifically the community center. And, and again, I, I want to thank. Um, uh, the Parks and Rec Committee, specifically the Chairman Commissioner Mitchell III, for, for ensuring those projects got to the place that they are right now. Um, again, um, that I need, um, if Director Dukes is there, I just want you to confirm um, the commentary that was extended by um, Terry Gable uh, over to SPLOS, which is we're, we're on track for that community center. That's something that has been obviously fought for uh, out on that side of town. Um, it actually completes um, Boundary Waters, which was a gym. I mean, as you know, we put a soccer field out there, a football field out there. Um, obviously, we put that uh, concession stand, duels. I mean, so this is sort of the crown jewel to sort of put this community center that goes along with our aquatic center and fields. Can you speak to that and confirm that we are on track in light of, uh, and I mean, barring normal, whatever you talked about, grading and dirt and so forth, are we on track and when do we anticipate the completion of that project? Director Dukes, if you're on the line. Uh, Commissioner Robinson, this is Mark Teal. Gary yes. Dukes is not on online. Okay. Um, this project is on track. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Terry, but it may be after the first of the year before uh, the building is completed. That's is that correct. correct. That's correct. But yes, sir, we are on track. We are on track. So, so again, I, I, I do appreciate all the efforts um, that has gone into this floss. I mean, not just things that are concentrated in, in, in the district, but also um, you know, the fire. I mean, I mean, just again, think about the 2009 SPLOS. There was nothing by way of, 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 of first responders. Yes, we had a new building, but they, they didn't have equipment. And I, I appreciate the fact that the fire uh, is being well taken care of. I, I know Madam Goddard gets credit for that, to ensuring that. But, but beyond that, it was necessary. So see the upgrades for, you know, this was a little bit more inclusive. I wish the sheriff would have been included by way of cars. But nonetheless, I mean, it, it's the hand that was dealt. And um, to, to hear the fire trucks, to hear the ambulance, to hear all that's like, oh, that's, that's, that's great. It was an upgrade. So I want to thank all of you guys for that. Madam Chair, that's it. That's my time. I yield. Thank you. <laughs> I had to get through that. Thank you. All right. No problem. Any other uh, comments from the Board of Commissioners before we move on? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Commissioner, sir? Uh, Terry? I see. Yes, ma'am. Um, Gail, since you're online, <laughs> let me ask you a question. A lot of people have been asking me, why aren't they paving now while the, there's no traffic? Uh, GDOT is paving in Atlanta. I witnessed, uh, personally witnessed uh, paving of a, of a lot here in Douglas County the other day. Surely we can distance each other on, uh, on a job like that. Construction is still open. Uh, because it's considered essential. So why are we not paving while the traffic is down? Well, uh, Commissioner, <clears throat> one, of, one of the difficulties when having uh, quite a number of uh, personnel in close proximity to the paving machine uh, is maintaining that social distancing. We're looking at, as soon as some of the criteria are relaxed, in terms of the distance and the number of personnel to be able to restart that. We're also bidding out and should be receiving bids um, probably the middle of May to do the, uh, the uh, uh, milling and the patching. That work has to be done before we do the paving. So. Uh, we're, we're working towards getting us to where we can start paving. And as soon as we're able to do that, we will. But uh, uh, at this point, uh, we're, we're being a little extra cautious in terms of getting that many personnel close to the paving machine, because once the paving machine is moving, 
uh, they, and laying down asphalt, they got to stay within a few feet of each other uh, doing that. So um, that's why we're being a little extra cautious. Well, I will say that the uh, paving job that I witnessed was uh, <clears throat> they were wearing masks. So, and they were outside. So, um, but anyway, <coughs> another question is Highway 5, the northbound turn lane. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, uh, the design team has taken a look at uh, that, um, the, the requirement there, the, the needs. Um, there are two components to the length of a turn lane, one being uh, the speed element that goes into uh, a vehicle being able to decelerate and make the turn. And the other component is is called referred to as the queuing. How many vehicles are likely to be waiting to make that turn? Uh, what they have found is that in order for that intersection turn signal uh, turn lane to be effective, the lane actually has to extend south much further than um, we had originally anticipated. So everything else in terms of how wide it needs to be, the, the issue at the very intersection with the proposed um, development there, that is, we're having discussions with them and that's still ongoing. Uh, however, the, the element of the length of the turn lane we're, we're going to need to have discussions with the developer because it's going to impact uh, not only the first driveway, but uh, the second driveway as well. So we're, we're um, conceptually have developed uh, a, a concept plan for the length and the width, uh, but we're, they're doing additional um, research in terms of what utilities are underground to see where those could be located. So we can then approach the developer with more specifics as to exactly how much width of right away we need and also the length of the lane, how far down it needs to go and what in, what other impacts it will have on those um, signs that uh, they installed along uh, uh, both driveways. Uh, <clears throat> Miguel, do you think that this job is um, in jeopardy? In, in terms of um, being able to be done or at all or uh, well <clears throat> we have two things going on we have uh, the development of that corner which I'm sure that um, the uh, owner of the property wants to move forward with if they have a contract or have a buyer in the queue so um, we have that to contend with and then we have um, <clears throat> all the funds about the, uh, bar, the virus, whether or not the sales taxes and the sploshed money is going to come in as uh, as bad, badly as we're anticipating. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> we're funding that entire project, and the state is not even on board with this. Uh, um, is that correct? Yes, yes, Commissioner, that is correct. Uh, however, because the road is uh, under state jurisdiction, we have to coordinate with them and they have to approve um, the improvements that we're proposing. So I, I don't, to, to answer your original question, I don't think uh, that project is in jeopardy from the standpoint of us being able to work something out with um, the, the width of the right of way that, that we can have. The, the issue right now is in terms of the lane itself, we know we can accommodate the lane. What we're looking into is where the utilities are going to go. And there are options for that, some more costly than others. For example, underground utilities normally don't want to be or we don't want them to be under the paved road or the paved lane. So having to relocate those the question is, well, can do we have enough uh, right of way to do the lane and relocate those utilities? And in order to answer those questions, we have to get more specifics. We have to have uh, more specific information as to where things actually are. So that is part of the work that's ongoing now. But I don't think from 
that standpoint, from the technical standpoint that the project is in jeopardy and from, from a funding standpoint, uh, the city is contributing 50% uh, of the cost. So uh, although the state is not participating, I, I would anticipate that uh, the project would be able to be done at some point, even if it has to be delayed uh, if, if necessary. But uh, the project is a worthwhile project and we continue with the design and then we'll we'll make a determination or the board will make a determ determination as to when to move forward in construction. And I will finish with this. Uh, this is uh, not a splash issue, but it is an issue with the people on the western side of the county. The southbound um, road work is being done at Douglas Boulevard and Highway 5. It has been stopped uh, since before Christmas. Do you know what's happening with that? Other, other than the issue they had with, with the utilities that's been resolved for a while, I'm not aware as to why. Uh, well, they, I know, there, they, I know they, there's been, I'm sorry. They moved the water thing uh, before Christmas. I actually ran into the contractor that was working on it at the Waffle House across the street. And he mm -hmm. said, we'll be through by Christmas. So they, they finished that and they've had the, the plate on the pavement uh, covering that, but I don't understand why they haven't started doing what they need to do to get that extra lane in there. Yeah, I, I agree that the project is not progressing as, as quickly as uh, it probably could or should. Um, they have done some additional work since they relocated the water line. They, they've worked on the median, taken out uh, part of the median to accommodate the additional length of the turn lane. So. That work has been done, but but beyond that, uh, I'm, I'm not aware as to any other issues keeping the contractor from proceeding with that work. Um, it is. Could you just check on it and, and get back with me, please? Uh, I get a lot of questions about that intersection. Sure, I'll be but happy. Just to get back that. with me. I don't want to take everybody's time up about that. But sure. anyway, I go back, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. All right, any other questions from the Board of Commissioners before we move on? I, I do have one, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, Commissioner Mitchell. Yes, yes, uh, and this is for Terry, I guess. I go back to Terry. Uh, Terry, are you still there with us? Yes, sir. Okay, Terry, so so you're saying there was a shortfall this time around on the, um, on the revenues, roughly about 70, if I remember correctly, about 70? Yes, 000. about 70,000. Okay. So that's offsetting that three roughly million that we had uh, that we were kind of in the, in the green for. We're looking pretty good on three million, correct? Correct. Okay, okay, all right, cool beans. Uh, and the radio system. So the radio system is, we're not behind on it, but we've got a couple other things. Really, I know we've got to wait and do the actual final testing coming up here soon. Can you give me the details on that once again? I know we've been on a couple of calls and, and following that project. I mean, I think we're doing excellent with it. We just got a couple of hiccups that we got to kind of cross, correct? Yeah, and, and the chief can chime in. But I think the biggest issue uh, came in with COVID-19 and, and getting uh, Motorola getting access to the facilities so they can do the technical testing. Right. That's what delayed, well, that's not knowing what will happen, but that's what has delayed it at this point. Uh, yeah. But there's at this point, uh, being optimistic about it, um, they're on schedule to complete it by, by the end of June. Right, the testing. And, and right, right, with the testing. And that'll be our 100% testing with a 95%, get me on those numbers correctly, I think it's 95 or 97%. 95% uh, coverage. Coverage okay. in the and, we, and we look to appear to be okay in that in that vein, correct? Yes, to my knowledge, it's been they've been very pleased with it, what they're experiencing in the field. Got it. And last but not least, um, how the sidewalk projects coming along? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we get on the sidewalk projects. And, and Miguel may can chime in, but they they're they're ready. Um, Miguel's got to get the. Uh, the contract documents completed. Uh, the plans are ready to go. Right away, everything's secured. It's just a matter of getting it in, uh, getting, um, getting, and I'm talking about Lithia Springs and Chestnut Log, uh, getting them in a letting. So outside of that, we should be okay. And 
I know we've been way off target, but <laughs> we should be there here soon, I guess. Yes, very soon. Got it. And and is, did David make it on to kind of update us on kind of how we're doing with uh, with those dollars and cents when it comes to minority and, and other type of makeups? Is, is David here with us, or, or or you can update us on that? Uh, yes, this is David Good. Can you hear me? Oh yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks, yes. David. Can you give us an update on on our minority contractors and how we're doing so great on that in that vein? Uh, well, right now we're still reaching out to all of our different um, type of contractors, making sure that we. Uh, go into the public sphere and let them know that these projects are going on. Um, at our next meeting, I'll be giving a full vendor um, update, which will include all the different vendors that we've had, you know, coming on, especially since this um, construction. So we're about the same as it was uh, last month, about close to like 39 to 40% minority participation, because right now so many different projects going on. There have been some minorities that have gotten uh, chances uh, from women-owned businesses to um, my, other minority-owned businesses. So right now we are on track of, as far as our numbers have kept have kept on rising. And as I've said before, that when it comes to out-of-state um, funds going into companies, it's because of Motorola, why that one is still uh, much higher because that's $16 million that was earmarked for them. Yeah. So everything that I track is based upon the purchase order, not actual cost. You'll see extra costs once that project is done. Then mm -hmm. those extra cost numbers will come in. So if we come in at fifteen million eight hundred instead of the little bit over sixteen million two, then you'll see right. that. So right now we are still tracking everything I sent to our press release earlier that said that the SPLOS team, even during this COVID nineteen period, we're still tracking everything we're tracking all of our projects and if there's any hiccups or any holdups we'll make sure we talk to the commissioners and you guys can get a release out to the public got it well thank you david and, and continue the great work that you guys are doing though and, and my last question though terry is and maybe more up to the chief if chief spencer on by chance so he can update us okay maybe not i just want to kind of hear from him to make sure he's on on board and okay with where we are with uh, the radio systems, kind of how we're coming along with that and kind of his intake on what that looks like. So, um, and I know you can't answer that though, Terry, so don't, don't, don't worry about that. So on that note, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll yield back and that'll be all I've got for right now. Thank you. Commissioner Mitchell, I'm here now. Excuse oh. me, I had to take out a second. <laughs> okay, all right. Could, could you, you repeat the question? No, I would just want you to share with us kind of where you are you okay with where we are with the radio system? I know we've had a couple of hiccups, nothing bad that, uh, that's taken us off course that much, but just kind of what your intake on where we are with the radio system now. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. We are uh, happy with the radio system. Uh, very happy, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, today, the uh, Metropolitan Communications is starting the installs of the mobile radios in all of the uh, sheriff's department vehicles. Uh, they completed the fire department installs last week. Uh, 911 has been up and running since uh, March 17th. Uh, and uh, all of our firefighters and uh, sheriff's department uh, ha have been using the system since the 17th. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. So uh, yes, sir, we're, we're we're happy with it. Uh, uh, we're we've been utilizing it since uh, March the seventeenth, and have had very few problems with it. Got you. Okay, okay. Just I, I know we've been on a couple of calls, and and it doesn't appear to me that we're having any issues. But I just want to kind of hear from you, and for those who will be using it, and how what's your got what you got to take on it though. So, but all is good then. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. I yield back. That's all I got. Okay, thank you, Madam, Commissioner Mitchell. Thank Madam you. Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Commissioner Guider. May I ask uh, Chief Spencer? Uh, well, it may, I may have to ask Mark. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> we're going to be under budget on the radio system, um, probably in the uh, amount of about $700,000 is what I'm looking at. Is that true, Mark? Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty close. Uh, well, uh, I was just wondering, um, on the COVID-19 expenses, there was uh, some full-face respirators and uh, filters and things for the fire department. 
can we fund that with splash funds no. saved by the radio system? <laughs> um, well, yes, we could, um, but we have to go through the cash flow. As far as what's in our cash flow with the splash uh, expenditures, we didn't put the full estimated amount of the radio system. We only put the contract amount in there. So as far as cash flow a, goes. You didn't have a contingency set aside in case something went yeah, wrong. Yeah, there's contingency. <clears throat> okay, how much was that? Um, I don't remember, but I think it was around 500,000. So um, the 700,000, does that include the 500,000 in the contingency? No, my understanding is on top of that. That was the that was the estimated amount from the beginning, minus the contract amount, which included a contingency line item. So um, I'm just wondering, uh, can we use some splash funds to offset some of the things that are required by the fire department? Because there's yes, certainly the responders. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We, we can, at, and we, are. we might look at that. The finance department might want to look at that because uh, we need to um, use some funds that we do have available. So anyway, with that, I yield back. Thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. Uh, Mark, were you finished? I believe you were wrapping up your sentence. What Did you have another comment, Mark? Oh, I was just saying, yes. Whenever we can use SPLOS funds, we will. Um, but also, we have to look at some of those expenses as well as far as face masks, M95 masks, some of those supplies, um, hopefully we'll get reimbursed through uh, GEMA and FEMA on those as well. So yes, we'll look at all uh, revenue sources. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm gonna move on to the next um, topic. Uh, Board of Commissioners, I didn't, for some reason I missed tab number four and I would like to go with that before I call for our next presentation. Tab number four is authorization to approve an MOU with GDOT to install roadway lighting lighting at uh, State Route uh, 402 I-20 uh, at State Route 5 Bill R uh, Interchange, North and South Ramps, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. I believe, is this yours, Mark, or, or uh, Miguel? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am, it's mine. Okay, so this Mark. is the, the exact same as the last two MOUs we had on last meeting, um, which were um, Lee Road and Chapel Hill Road, I believe, um, for the first two MOUs. This one we received from the state this week, actually probably Thursday, we added it to the agenda. Um, so it's a memorandum of understanding for us to maintain the lights um, the street lights at this location. So the street lights at the end of the ramps where um, Greystone is in the process of getting their permit. This should be the last step on this location for them to receive a permit and we'll have MOUs. We'll bring them to the board as soon as we receive the rest of them from uh, GDOT. Okay, thank you so much, County Administrator. Uh, board of Commissioners, any questions regarding tab number four or comment? Okay, I'm gonna move on to our next presentation. I didn't, Board of Commissioners, I didn't forget uh, tab number five is intentional. I'm gonna come back to that once these two presentations are uh, made. Our first presentation is our Community Service Board update. Uh, Mr. Ray Lightford, are you on the line? Are you? Ray Lightford, are you, are you here? I am here, good morning. Okay, good morning, good morning. Would you please, um, you have a presentation this morning, would you please present uh, to the uh, Board of Commissioners? Um, I believe we need someone to turn that camera off. Um, okay. Can everybody see the presentation? Yes. Can everybody see, Board of Commissioners, can you see? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Basically, this uh, presentation is, is uh, just a breakdown of what's happening with our revenue flow uh, due to COVID-19. We had to make some uh, really touch, uh, tough adjustments um, back in the beginning of March that have had a financial impact. Um, and just talking about that a little bit, as well as uh, some of the things that we do know that are happening um, at the uh, state level and the federal level as far as it pertains to mental health. Um, 
So uh, one key point I wanted to talk about, back at the beginning of March, we had to uh, cease our intellectual and developmental disability day services. Um, this program is, is, is probably one of our, our, our largest revenue generators. Um, and one of the reasons that we had to cease these activities uh, due to social distancing is that this, this population um, have very uh, seriously uh, 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 excuse me, behavioral health issues as well as kind of hard for them to actually navigate with the social distancing uh, rules along with follow on uh, complications such as cerebral palsy, diabetes, um, their tube fed, spina bifida, um, it, the list just goes on. And so one of the things for their safety, we had to cease those services. Um, we've attempted to slowly move into a telehealth platform with them to offset some of the costs that we are losing, but we do have a very large population of those individuals who cannot utilize that technology and also um, uh, suffer from being deaf and mute or, or nonverbal. Um, and so that's the look of about what we're absolutely losing um, about $50,000 a, a month when it pertains to intellectual developmental disabilities. Um, as far as the mental health population, we saw some of the same things happening as well um, with our homeless activities, um, as well as some of our substance abuse groups. Um, because once again, uh, those complicated immune systems, not having proper access to um, uh, hygiene equipment, as well as um, some of the things that we may take prevent, uh, advantage of day to day that they just might not have the ability to have access to. Uh, running water, other things like that. And so once again, we had to um, <clears throat> reduce the amount of services that we provide to those individuals, um, which again is about another average loss of around $50,000 um, a month. Um, and so right now our projection is that between uh, March 1st and the end of June, we will lose uh, roughly $406,000. Um, now some of the things that we have done uh, with this, we have had to uh, introduced telehealth platforms. Um, we had a very small cost bringing those systems on um, to our infrastructure. But what we see is about a 70% decrease in revenues because most of our services in the fee-for-service model are time generated. Um, and just to be honest and frank, people like to stay on the phone less than they like to talk face-to-face. -face. And so we see reductions um, as well in that area. Okay, some, some of the facts that we have right now. Um, so one of the things we looked into was the SBA loan program, but due to our quasi-governmental status, we were not able to um, get approved for that loan. Um, another area was the SAMHSA CARES Act, which is directly for the indigent population suffering from mental health issues. Um, because our population was under the 500,000, um, it seemed that the state of Georgia would be given those funds direct and they will appropriate those funds at some time um, to each uh, community as they see fit. Okay, and then another thing is that um, the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities of Georgia decided to shift from fee-for-service model, which is that basically we got reimbursement on the amount of people that we served, service to a guaranteed monthly drawdown for the duration of COVID-19. So um, from March to the end of June, which would conclude the fiscal year for mental health in Georgia, um, and that's in process now. So we're awaiting updates daily for that and what that revenue will look like uh, moving forward. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to assure the, the board as well as um, our citizens that we are still up and open for operations. Um, we are providing services, telehealth for those individuals who have fear and anxiety about coming in. But as well, we still maintain our, our open status for those individuals that need medication administration, uh, injections, and may need hospital placement. Um, and so we've, we've continued to operate this way throughout um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, so our request is, uh, is, is, is pretty simple. We're requesting to try to help offset some of that cost that we're, we're currently occurring and losing because of our services adjustment. Um, these revenues will be used to contribute to our addiction housing program, our, our mental health housing programs, um, as well as to continue to be able to provide uh, various services to our indigent population or our homeless population. Um, right now, one of the other things that we've done is that we have not furloughed or reduced our mental health staff at all um, because we know that we are an aftercare agency and that uh, once this pandemic is over, that's when we're going to have to be able to stand up and answer the call. Um, I will tell you right now, nationally, two of the biggest drivers for behavioral health and substance abuse issues is um, concerns about employment, safety, and also isolation. And so we know that our numbers are going to increase at some point in time 
uh, toward the end of the pandemic. Um, and then lastly, uh, just the, um, continue having funding for our operational costs, such as our equipment, our lab testing, uh, our ability to, to get the medications in to continue to help service our population. Um, one of the things that a lot of people really don't know that we do for a lot of our individuals, we serve as their primary care provider as well. So our doctors are writing their prescriptions for their blood pressure medication, their diabetes, um, cholesterol, and all of those, as well as the um, medications they need for their mental health issues. Um, Madam Chair, I yield back to you for any questions. Okay, thank you so much, uh, our Director Lyford. Um, Board of Commissioners, before I chime in, Ray, you did address, uh, I'm going to speak uh, first, and I'm just going to say you addressed those comorbidities that are out there related to our mental health population that our doctors, our psychiatrists are also providing medication, and also I call just that interventional care for our, our citizens. Um, thank you for your presentation. I'm just, before I go any further, I'll just yield and ask the Board of Commissioners, do they have any questions about the services you provide to our citizens here in Douglas County. Any questions from the board before? Madam Chair? Yes, Vice Chairman Robinson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, mm -hmm. Director um, Leifert, thank you for being on, on, on this call and presenting this. Um, obviously, um, the Board of Commissioners as a whole has made it shown a commitment uh, to health care here at the local level. Um, over the past couple of years, I mean, at least in this administration, we've shown a commitment uh, by increasing um, our overall commitment from 2%. And I, I believe Director Hallman, you can correct me, we are probably have gone up to maybe 4%. Um, um, Director Hallman, can you confirm that number for us that in as it relates to our overall budget, how much, what percentage is, is contributed to um, public health in general or health care in general? Director Hallman? Yes, I'll I'll pull the number and confirm in just a sec. All right, so while, while you're doing it, that's fine. All right, so I, I know at one point we were spending, if our overall budget is 100 million, just for the record, we spent 2% um, was allocated to, to health. That's defects, that's seniors, that's, I mean, think about it. Just 2% was dedicated to this whole bucket, which is um, the human side of us, the human side of our community. All right, our welfare, only 2% of our budget was dedicated to this. I do appreciate Madam Chair's leadership to helping expand this. Uh, obviously, the Community Service Board um, um, has, has, has has been a tremendous um, um, asset to us. Um, the new building, uh, bringing uh, Ray Lightford on board as far as expansion is concerned, that's important. So um, I acknowledge where we are right now. I, I recognize where COVID has had an impact. Um, and I, I asked, it sounds like there's an ask for roughly $100,000 per month um, until the fiscal year kicks in for the state of Georgia. Um, um, Director Lightford, is that really what this is about? There's an ask of, of, of commitment from the Board of um, Commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Robinson, uh, yes. I mean, we, we really um, tried to maintain our posture, not having a reduction in staff, so that once COVID, um, our procedures that we're taking place now, the phases start to transcend that we will be able to stand up and operate and go. Um, and, and that's what that ask is for, is so that we can maintain our current structure to be available to the citizens when they need. Um, I will just give a little uh, light to, to go to that two and that 4% contribution as well for mental health. Last year, we serviced 5,307 citizens in Douglas County suffering from serious and persistent mental health issues, uh, homelessness, and substance abuse. Um, out of that, 1,047 were children. Um, and so these, these dollars will, will be greatly utilized to continue our case management programs, our supportive employment programs for those individuals, and our transition services for our individuals that are now coming back into the community from uh, prior incarcerations. All right, and so let's, I, I gotta, let's not isolate mental health to being just those who don't have access to health care. That, that, that would be, um, a misstatement. Mm -hmm. Mental health, um, not necessarily mental illness, is everybody is subject to that. Everyone. Mm -hmm. It's not a class issue. It's a health issue. And so I want to drive home the point while I recognize that 2% of our budget, whether it's 2 or 4% is dedicated um, to those who probably don't have access to health care. Mental, mental health, it, it's again, it's everybody. And what we're going through now, people get to process it differently. They may have private care. They may have different ways in which they fund it. 
but everybody is subject to this. And so as we go through this COVID, uh, and with 10% of our overall population is going to be unemployed. And I mean, just the dreams and the things that we had because we were healthy, nothing was wrong. And for this thing to be shut down on us, to think that mental health is not going to come to the forefront, um, you, you don't even have to go there. It's going to matter. And we're going to have to focus on mental health. Um, it's not just the, the physical health of, of, of sort of what we call those who may be exposed to uh, the sickness, but the overall population is going to be greater. There'll be more people impacted from mental health than the physical health associated with the, um, obviously the, um, the virus. And so we can't lose sight of it's, it's both. It's physical health and mental health. And we need to have uh, an acknowledgement that says, look, guys, we got to deal with both of these. It's not sequential, it's concurrent. And this is sort of that first indicator. And I, I appreciate I was involved in that conversation last week, said, no, you can't isolate this to being a financial committee issue. This is a board of commissioner. Everybody, y'all need to weigh in on this. This is like, and it's the beginning. This is just beginning. Where we're getting real numbers in and said, okay, here we go. All right, here we go. So I only bring that out. I'm buying time. Jennifer, can you confirm for me, Director Hallman, that was just sort of a side. Go ahead. Yes. Um, you can say that it was uh, just under 2% a few years ago. Now we're about 3%, but as you know, because our budget has grown, that's why you don't see that big differential in the percentage-wise. But dollar-wise, you're looking at about a million dollars more to health and welfare than in the previous years. Right. And we, we don't have to cover it now. We'll take it to finance. I actually want to say, if you take away the, the increase in our overall budget, what would the impact been? You know, if we isolated it. But uh, we can we can cover that. Um, later. All right, so I'm going to finish my, my, my statement in my ad. So, um, Director uh, Lightford, um, and, and again, we recognize this is a specialized population. Uh, I think it was um, an important call. I think, Madam Chair, you called it. Uh, it's something that obviously um, your background um, um, gave you great insight and said, hey, we need to, we need to close that facility. Uh, it was uh, obviously there's a lot of group activities, but they were exposed. And so I um, that was one of those where we, we we deliberately and intentionally shut that down for the greater good. Uh, but obviously, there was a revenue impact on that. And so they ask is that how do we fill that hole when it was intentional? I'm not put, trying to put words in anyone's mouth, but I do acknowledge the decision that was made, and I believe it was the right thing for the greater good. Um, um, so I have I, I support the ask that's being asked here, but we must um, do that in, 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 in recognizing there is a greater uh, a greater need as well, and we need to balance all of it. So, Madam Chair, I yield. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Robinson. Any other comments from the Board of Commissioners? Any yes, ma'am. Uh, Commissioner Guider. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Director, uh, I'm sorry. You're like Because my agenda is different than yours. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> Lightford, yes. Um, would it <clears throat> maybe I should ask this to the chairman or the uh, the uh, finance director? Would it be feasible for us to have uh, Mr. Corbin look at their situation? Um, he is an expert in financial um, affairs, and um, we have got to keep our compassion, but we've also cannot direct all of our intentions or our directions just on emotion. We've got to, uh, <clears throat> I was looking at this, we spent more money on the food for the homeless than we did for the uh, seniors. So uh, for the, because of this, um, you know, there are pantries where food can be uh, gotten for free. Uh, I have a lot of people I direct to pantries through my Celebrate Recovery because they've lost their jobs and they're not uh, bringing any money in to buy food for them and their families. Well, they go to pantries. Why can't we utilize pantries? The churches have pantries. My church has one uh, at Ephesus Baptist Church. There's one on Midway Road. There's one on Grady Street in Douglasville. We have got to utilize the um, faith-based community to help us through this. We cannot fund everybody. We cannot 
come up with four hundred and something thousand dollars because they've lost revenues. They may have to lay off people or let the people draw unemployment. I don't know, but that we have got to look at this in more detail. We can't just have a blanket. I need four hundred and something thousand dollars to keep on doing what I'm doing. I understand there's a need. But there's a need everywhere throughout this county. There's a need everywhere. We've got to be more specific. And I would just suggest that maybe uh, Mr. Corbin, uh, even if we have to pay him a, a little extra money to look at uh, the situation over at the Community Service Board and see where they could cut some costs. Everybody's got to cut. We may have to lay off employees. I was talking to uh, the mayor of Villarica this morning. They're talking about laying off employees. Uh, uh, another city has laid off 25 employees. Um, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how much longer we're going to be shut down uh, because our numbers, I don't think, have gone down, have they, uh, Chairman? Um they keep going up as far as the number of cases, but not the number of deaths, thank goodness. But we have got to keep compassion, but we've also got to keep logic in there too. You can't get blood out of the turnip, as we used to say in the South. <laughs> and we have got to look at more specific things. Uh, what is needed right now just to get us through until this economy is opened up and we have additional revenues. Um, we cannot replace everybody's loss. We can't replace our loss. We're going to have to cut services in order to fund what we have uh, already obligated ourselves to. So we, we've just got to look at things not with a broad paintbrush, but with a little detail brush. And um, I, I would urge that the Board of Commissioners have Mr. Corbin look at the um, situation over the Community Service Board. But we've, are, we've got to learn that we can't do everything for everybody. And with that, I yield back. Thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. Any other comments from the Board of Commissioners? Anybody yeah. else want to come in? Yeah. Oh, Commissioner Carthen. Yes. yes. I'm looking okay. for your, your initials. I didn't see you. Okay. Um, so one of my questions is um, for Ray Lightford. Can you explain uh, again, because I heard Commissioner Guider speak something about food, and I don't think the CSB has anything to do with food. It's more so the services that we um, provide or that they provide um, for the community in terms of um, mental health, physical health, and um, transitional um, help with um, rents and utilities for those um, um, homeless um, and transient families. Um, if Ray could e explain that a little bit more for for uh, Commissioner Guider and probably for our public who who is watching. So if Ray could um, do that for us. And also, Ray, uh, my second question for you is, how can you help us in terms of looking at um, testing and treatment um, when we decide to open the county back up? Is there a way that you can help us to facilitate that um, since you do have staff? Um, is there a way that we could partner with you in terms of getting um, those types of um, amenities um, as well? Um, those are my two questions. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Carthen. Um, so to kind of just give the community an idea of our services. So right now, currently, with transitional housing, um, this is for any citizen that may be suffering from depression, anxiety, uh, or a whole gamut of mental health issues. We have a federally funded housing program. Currently, right now, today, we house 147 individuals in Douglas County um, through scattered placement. Um, we are the largest houser of people in Douglas County. Um, and we also have eight individual homes that we actually own to house those people as well. Um, we also have uh, supported employment services. So individuals that lose their jobs, we actually have job coaches that go out, train new skills, and help them get back into the workforce. Um, and these are just two of our programs that are outside of our just mental health core capacity. Um, we also have intensive case management services for those individuals who just don't have those routine skills or, or, or those abilities to adapt that some of us take for granted day to day, um, such as being able to balance a budget or a checkbook. 
or, or, or being able to, to identify all of the community resources that are out there to navigate the waters to, to become uh, more active in the community and have a more viable life. Um, and to allude um, a little bit on your second part of your question, um, as far as our capabilities, as far as uh, COVID-19 in the future, well, as testing has, has been morphed, um, initially the, um, the swab test went all the way back into the very rear of the nasal cavity. Um, and because of that and the risk factors included, uh, public health had decided that only uh, general practitioners will be able to administer that test. Um, with some of the new tests that they are working on right now, um, those swabs that are just in the frontal part of the, uh, the nasal cavity, uh, some of the uh, tap and touch testing, we would absolutely be able to, to follow on and support um, those uh, services. Um, right now, we have three locations in Douglas County. Um, it would be very easy for us to convert one of those locations into a testing facility um, as need be. So we will be able to help stand up and assist public health um, in that um, environment if, if need be. Thank you, uh, Ray. I, I appreciate that. I just didn't want it to, to seem like we're just, you know, uh, helping you, you know, to facilitate keeping staff on. Your staff is needed because you all help to keep this county, I, I, I would say, help the quality of life for those citizens um, who are our neighbors. So Community Services Board just doesn't give our food and, and, and you know, you do a lot to keep to keep us stable and and to help this community um, stabilize itself. Um, I also appreciate that you can assist us in um, in those necessary ways so that we can open this county back up. I know we have 1,200 employees um, that will probably probably need testing. Um, we would love to have you all work with us in that way. So it's it's vital that we help to keep the community services board um, up and afloat. Um, so with that, Madam Chair, um, I I think I yield. Yes, I yield. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other com comment before I, I close out? Commissioner yes, Mitchell. Yes. yes. So, uh, Mr. Lightfoot, just, uh, I just want to make sure for clarity. You just stated that $100,000 per month is what you're, you're requesting, if I'm hearing this correctly or not. So I want to make sure I heard that correctly. Commissioner Mitchell, uh, yes, um, that is correct. Um, that'll help assist and match our shortfall. Um, with a lot of our programs that are federally funded, they are uh, in-kind match or we pay the revenues up front and then get reimbursed. Um, right now we're facing cash flow issues based on losing those revenues. And so just any, any and everything that was a reserve is now going forward to pay for rent and utilities for these individuals that we're trying to maintain housing while we're trying to get our service numbers back up. Um, some of the issues, uh, I'll give you a great example. Telehealth pays about 70% less than what a face-to-face -face visit would pay um, for normal routine services. But we had, we've had to go to that method because of safety. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I still have that same, you know, psychiatric, psychiatric cost that is sitting there. Um, some of the other issues are group services. We've had to suspend all of those because of these high-risk populations and being able to have them contained in certain areas. Some of our people don't have smartphones that have video capability. Um, and because of telehealth and HIPAA rules, I cannot just provide that phone conference as a group without verifying a person's identity. So now we've had to, to lessen or to drop those services off altogether. And so that's what this is, is gap or bridge funding to get us back on our feet once um, we start to move into those other phases of reopening our county. And just one for clarity. So this money could be reimbursable back to the county or should we expect that or I'm, I'm not sure. Make sure I'm, so the public and all of us will understand. Um, well, Commissioner, uh, <laughs> Commissioner Mitchell, yes, it could be reimbursed, um, but all of that is going to be driven by time frame. And then I'll also uh, just explain a little bit about a pandemic to the community. The pandemic is the community at, at large now suffering from a mental health uh, or a, a skewed vision of reality, which right. is going to impact how long or how quick it is before people come back into services, um, being able to take up and continue routine life. And so the intention would be to get to a point to where those revenues could be given back to the community. Um, I cannot guarantee that based on how long that the, the mind frame and the fear factor exists within the community. Right, right. I understand. I, I'm, and I'm only just trying to think it out loud so everybody can kind of hear it and understand kind of what we're up against. Um, I get what you're doing. I understand why you're doing what you're doing. But I think the public need to kind of understand what you're saying, that 
this hundred additional one hundred thousand dollars per month. Here's where it goes. Here's what you're doing, and here's why we're doing this before we move in that direction. So um, interesting, though. So I yield back. I just wanted to make that clarity known. So and make it public. So thank you again. Appreciate it. I yield. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. And uh, just as I wrap it up and close this particular presentation out, uh, certainly we are in a state of emergency. Commissioner Guider, I believe you have concerns about COVID-19. COVID-19 is, is an anomaly for all of us. It's new. Uh, certainly we could not prepare for it. Uh, Corbin, David Corbin will be attending our finance meeting today. Certainly he is. he does not have a magic wand and he could not predict this, uh, could none of us. Also, again, I just wanted to highlight the fact that we have a special needs population. I believe it's about 60 citizens who have comorbidity problems. And also they have a lot of things that Ray mentioned earlier today, uh, Asperger's disease, all types of things, but we still, that's those uh, citizens are Douglas County citizens and we're one Douglas. And I don't want to minimize our citizens in that respect. So that's the reason why uh, Ray Lyford is before this Board of Commissioners today. Certainly, we want to make sure we provide services to our mental health and also our special needs population and not just allow this um, entire center to be wiped off the grid as a result of saying that we didn't want to put emotion. We, we wanted to certainly uh, uh, not put our emotion before logic. Right now, it's no emotion. It's bottom line. We have a, we in a state of emergency and something happened unexpectedly. And I would like to, if possible, this Board of Commissioners uh, would just consider the funding uh, request. All right, Board of Commissioners, we have one more um, presentation this morning, and then I'll lead back into the resolution uh, that Commissioner Carthen worked on, or should I say she drafted, and it, it's a very good resolution, and it may address, address some of the concerns uh, that, uh, should I say, address some of these presentations, and that's why I wanted the presentations to go first. Next, uh, Ray Lightford, are you finished? Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm going to move on to Douglas County COVID-19 Small Business Fund presentation. This morning, we have Chris Pumphrey and Sarah Ray this morning to talk about the small businesses and the impact here in Douglas County. Chris Pumphrey, yeah. are you there? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you all for, for your time this morning and uh, just kind of keeping... Um, along the, the same lines of discussion and the things that you are preparing for, um, we have also been kind of looking at what could we do to really help um, our small businesses, which truly are the lifeblood um, of our entire country. Uh, and so we've been looking at some things over the last several weeks and wanted to uh, present this to you as well as you take on considerations for what you as Board of Commissioners can do for, um, for relief um, for our community. Um, so myself uh, and Sarah and a small group that represents members of my board and hers uh, have been looking at what could we do to help support financially a number of our communities. As we all know, the uh, SBA uh, fund that was put out um, a few weeks back um, ran out of its $350 billion of funding as of Thursday um, of last week. And they were extremely overwhelmed um, with uh, requests for funding uh, through through the banks. Um, we had, you know, two of our board members are bankers, and they have been really um, uh, on the front lines of supporting businesses here um, uh, on this matter. Uh, they have both, I think, all together funded over 60 or so uh, businesses uh, through the SBA funding. Um, a number of them um, were awarded, but they also had a number of clients that requested funds that were not able to, um, to get those funds. And through that and through our discussions with them, you know, they definitely both agreed that there is definitely a need um, for supporting um, our small businesses um, beyond um, what has been put out there um, thus far. So unlike you know past economic downturns that were really kind of a slow roll, and to your point, you know, uh, Chairman um, Jackson Jones, that this is something that really hit suddenly. Um, there was something that businesses that no one could really prepare for um, in order to to maintain it and stave off as much as possible. Um, just like with the plans for the SBA, you know, we want to keep as many people employed and businesses running as possible. 
I mean, to really kind of curb um, the 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 uh, how severe this pandemic is for our for our businesses. So we evaluated um, a number of communities from across the country that have put in these small business relief funds. Some of them have been loans, loan programs. Some of them have been grant programs, um, and they range and vary in scope. Um, but we're seeing them become more and more popular as community real, communities realize that the SBA alone won't be enough um, to, to minimize the impact of this. So you all should have received a document uh, from me that really kind of outlined um, in general the scope of what we are proposing. Um, what we are doing is targeting uh, to have a $750,000 fund that is both publicly and privately funded. Um, and we'll, on the public side, looking towards you all as Board of Commissioners, um, the City Council for Douglasville, um, the Development Authority, um, as public partners, as private partners, looking to the Chamber um, as a partner in that fund, and then talking to some other larger businesses um, that are in a position to help assist um, our, our target small businesses. And so when I speak to target small businesses, we're talking about businesses with employees um, between two to 25 employees um, that have been in business for at least one year as of March 1st, 2020. Um, those businesses that are current um, on their Secretary of State's filings, um, obviously Douglas County um, licensing and uh, property taxes um, and, and what have you and that the, the funds could be used towards working capital um, to assist the business operation. Um, we would look, we're targeting grants that would be, that would be capped at $5,000 per company. Now, a little bit of reality in this, there are 5,000 plus businesses um, incorporated in Douglas County. Um, if we have a $750,000 fund, um, we can only reach and we, and if all, if we issue $5,000 grants to every awardee, we will only be able to assist 150 companies. If you do the math and you try and apply that to all of those businesses, it would exceed the, the, the budget. So uh, we're trying to be realistic in what we can do, but be able to, as, as we mentioned, you know, get those businesses who have, from a preference standpoint, um, were not able to get funding from the PPP, um, that are Douglas County based businesses um, that are all obviously all current with two to 25 employees. Um, we have laid out the, uh, a skeleton of what the, what the communications and process would look like. Um, we have already obtained the, um, all of the incorporated companies in Douglas County uh, through um, both the city and county's uh, databases. So we have all that information. Uh, we would get um, mailers out to all of those businesses, um, informing them that a fund would go live. Um, and we would also use social media platforms and email platforms to ensure that if you are a business in Douglas that you didn't miss it because we only chose one media uh, format to, to communicate through. Our goal would be to go live um, with the application on May 13th. That application would be solely electronic. Everything would be done online. All documents would be submitted online. And, and all of those applications would be time stamped. So we would have that application go live May 13th with the a goal to stay live for 10 days. Um, and upon meeting all of the eligibility requirements that we lay out um, in the beginning, um, and if they, they met all those requirements, then it goes to a first come first serve basis. So all those electronic applications would be um, electronically um, time stamped. So we would know when those came in. And then when we get to the point that we've, we've got, we've capped out our funds, um, then we would close, um, close the funding. Um, we would also work with um, our bank, uh, Service First Bank, to um, open up um, ACH uh, processing. So we would attain um, the, the necessary information from the awardees um, as far as account information, with the preference being that we do everything through a direct deposit. Um, if not, then we have to go through checks. And just like how those things are working out with the federal government, it's best to go with the ACH process. Um, just the check process will take a little bit longer. 
Um, that is really the, the gist of the program. Um, Sarah Ray um, is on the, uh, on the line as well. Um, Sarah, if you, there's anything else that you wanna add um, to that, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Um, I think the only other thing that I would add is just in kind of being on on the front lines of dealing with our small businesses over the last six weeks or so, is that um, this is something that is very much needed in our community. It is something that you know. I mean, since the um, SBA kind of announced that the funds were maxed out last Friday. I've probably gotten 50 plus phone calls, countless emails on people that don't have a direction on, you know, what what kind of funding options there are. So um, if this is something that our community can come together to provide to our businesses that, that are here, I think that um, it's something that would be greatly appreciated. And um, just really think that uh, it's it's def the need is definitely there, and there are some businesses that I have spoken with that are completely directionless on how to navigate all of this. Um, you know, so I definitely just completely am supportive on behalf of the business community that I've been talking to. That um, this is definitely it's definitely something that I would love to be considered um, by the board of commissioners. So, thank you. Yes, and we would um, propose, you know, as I mentioned, a fund of seven hundred and fifty thousand. Um, we would re we are requesting that the board of commissioners would consider um, contributing two hundred thousand to that fund. Um, you are the first kind of official request um, that we have made. Um, we've we've had kind of soft conversations to this point. Uh, we'll be uh, asking council uh, next week um, for a contribution as well. Um, and we've got some private feelers um, out there right now, one of which I should hear back from uh, later um, this afternoon about their ability uh, to contribute to the fund as well and, and looking, targeting a six-figure contribution um, to the fund. Okay. Are you, are you finished, Chris and Sarah? That's your presentation. Yes, okay. Uh, certainly, as we um, encroach a public private partnership, that's what I'll call it. You, I was just getting ready to ask, what is the ask? You said 200,000 from mm -hmm. the county, and then you said you'll be an, engaging in conversations with the city um, yes, this week as well, okay. Okay, I think uh, one question I have, will there be a contribution from the chamber and the development authority? Are you planning, I heard you say, to, to get up to six, uh, to that six figure, $1 million deal. So is, is there a plan for contribution on your end as well? Yes. Yeah, so for the development authority, um, we would look at um, our, our goal is to try and kind of fill the gap, but we, we would look at a minimum contribution of 100000 to go in. Okay. And on behalf of the chamber, we're still having a conversation with our, it's at our executive board level right now, as far as if and, and what level we want to contribute. So it's an undetermined number at this point. Yeah. And I, and I do echo you um, you both, Sarah and Chris, our, our small businesses are the heartbeat of our community and um, really appreciate everything that they do, especially um, being a daughter of a 50 year business owner. I understand uh, what goes on behind the, the veil with these small businesses. Board of Commissioners, do you have any um, comments or questions? Madam Chair. Yes, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll be succinct. Again, all of this is related. Um, um, obviously, this is a well-planned agenda today. Um, it's all about um, appropriations um, in light of our current COVID. What, what do we do? What do we do for our citizens? It, it, I mean, everything is not about self. I, I get self-preservation, but self-preservation is that it, it includes our neighbors, right? So it, 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 it to be inclusive, not an exclusion. And, and while I recognize that there's limitations, you have to have the conversation about the limitations. Uh, it should not be ever a decision about either or, uh, a me versus you. It's how, how do we all, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we get through this moment? Uh, obviously, all of us have been involved in conversations at board commissions with our uh, respective circle of influence, our circle of, of, of companies that we've come in contact with. Uh, whether they're nonprofit or for-profit, 
Uh, there's been um, questions that have been asked, so what, what will the board do? Um, and again, we're going to just stay in our lane. We recognize that we're not the feds. We can't print money. We, 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 we don't have that type of capacity. Uh, we recognize that we're not the state. We're a moderate sized county at the local level, but there, there is something that we can do um, and that we should do. Um, and it's just a matter of um, what will we do? So that being said, with that as a, as a backdrop, um, obviously I brought this up about three or four weeks ago. Um, and because it's the speed of decision-making that we have to do. You don't, you don't have all day. You don't have three months to go through nothing. If Congress can pass two trillion or six trillion dollars, surely we can too, right? If, if five people can't get in the room and figure out what is in the best interest of 150,000 people versus Congress that has to deal with 300 million, we can do this, right? And we can process this. Um, we, we don't need a bunch of advisors um, in certain moments. It's like, no, you're on your own. You got to take a position and, and be able to make a decision on the best half of, of the citizenry at large. It's the collective will of the board. That being said, um, obviously, this is something that I followed. I, I don't have to get into, um, um, you know, banking and entrepreneurship, which is which is my background. But Chris, I, I, my question is really to you, uh, which is I've always had a concern about uh, when we take on services and when we want to do things, the question is always, how will you deliver it? It's one thing for the Board of Commissioners to appropriate. It's another about the delivery. You can sell anything, but can you deliver and so I've always been concerned about scale. We've had this conversation internally for the public and we've had serious debate and one-offs and I've always, I've, I've been hesitant. As much as I wanna do it, I'm like, the administration is not in the business of doing this. The only person I believe that probably could pull this off would be like the task commissioner that had an infrastructure in place to do this. We just don't have it here in Douglas County. So I'm always looking to partner with people who are already in place to be able to do this. Obviously banks, um, uh, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm totally against loans. I, I don't believe in um, putting people further in debt. I mean, you're already putting them in debt by um, pushing out foreclosures, I mean, delaying all these things. I mean, you're, we're, we're stacking up. If you're going to help them, help them. So I appreciate the fact that the grant is sort of what's being offered up. Um, you don't put, need to put people in further bondage and trying to say that I'm helping you, but I'm going to put you in bondage. And nor do I want to be in the business of collecting um, small loans against our, 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 our citizens. No way. Uh, I want to be in that business. So, Chris, from an infrastructure perspective, in, in recognizing, even if you said that um, we're only going to be able to help 150 people, the capacity, people are still going to apply. And it's a grant. So, how are you going to do this? How are y'all going to scale up? And you may not have an answer, because again, we're okay with appropriations with the condition that you got the infrastructure in place. You know, In other words, we, we can always put that in, but talk to us about that, because obviously, uh, it's one thing to have your, you know, can, can you pull it off? Answer that first. Sure. So the, the first piece is, is one, you know, getting, getting communications out and being very clear with what the communications are. Um, you know, what are the expectations for qualification? Um, what are the documents that are necessary to be provided um, for, for said application, ensuring that whatever system we use um, can stand up to the amount of, um, I guess, individuals that are actively in it. So we minimize the crash like SBA had um, on, on, on their system. Um, and so it's putting those, one, communicating out first, you know, what the requirements are and making sure we have our system in place for receiving the applications. Um, we then are simplifying the requirements and we're removing subjectivity from the process. And so we're making it a very objective process where the requirements are laid out at the very beginning. Um, you check the boxes if all those requirements are met, um, the documents satisfy, and that we're not interpreting information within the documentation. So we would have a small group committee, I believe in the document I listed there, kind of members of that committee that consist of both chamber board um, and development authority board. We would welcome, um, if you would like to have someone else from um, representing the county in that process, representing the city in that process as well, so that we have, you know, all those hands kind of there looking at everything and making sure we're checking things off. So that's the, the first part. The second part is on our back end internal work. Um, we have, from a staff standpoint, have about a, a teams between both the development authority and chamber, about 10 people. So we would have all of our uh, FAQs in place. 
um, how you know to communicate what phone numbers to dial in order to you know get further information um, but that most of that will then lead everyone back to one single source here's our website here's everything you need to know um, we're going to try and make all of that done up front um, before anything ever goes out before that application goes live um, so that's the reason we're not proposing that this starts next week and um, we're giving ourselves at least three weeks to have all of that in place um, and then once again from the point of distributing funds um, our preference is to work through ACH um, and we will work with our partner at Service First Bank in order to issue um, the funds and then mail the checks out. Um, but the good thing now is that we have all of the um, uh, licensing information from both you all in the city and the county, and so we're making sure we're getting everyone, we're getting to everyone that has a, a valid business in Douglas. Yeah, I appreciate that, and I'm, I want to acknowledge the fact that you, you we, the Board of Commissioners, I appreciate you guys helping strengthen the Development Authorities Board by by adding bankers, because I think that was always something that was critical. So um, I, I have assurance that these guys have thought through this on from that side. So I appreciate that. My next question becomes more of a, um, um, you've got the city and the county, and I, I, I separate them separately. Um, we, we recognize that. Uh, the development authority tends to be industry and the chamber tends to be its its membership. Uh, then you have um, the uh, the city versus the county. Uh, one of the things I want to make uh, give assurance is that if the county puts up dollars, I want to make sure that those businesses that are in, unincorporated get their fair share. Likewise, I, I can't speak for the city, but I'm, I'm sure they would recognize and acknowledge that sentiment. How do we balance that? Because again, if the county was going to do it, it would do it properly. And then and I'm, I'm looking for balance. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for how do you assure that the public doesn't perceive, it's always about, Chris, we've had this conversation about optics, right? So how do we, in this moment, that, that, that it just doesn't, um, we don't self-select. And I, I get the criteria, I get first come, first serve, but how do we, like we're, we're, we're putting boundaries around, okay, you've got to be, one year older or two businesses versus having one employee and um, being open six months. I'm just making this up. But how, how do we find a balance to make sure that, okay, the tech, because we do a good job of separating county versus city and taxation and all these ink bonds and all that, right, to ensure that people get their fair share. I think likewise with this case, there needs to be uh, an acknowledgement. And I just want my peers to weigh in on this. Uh, after you answer it, Chris, and I have one more question, which is how do we deal with that? And I, I don't know, we have to solve it now, but I wanna make sure that the uninked people, the people in the county get their fair share that it doesn't uh, inherently get concentrated, even though a lot of um, obviously companies may be in the city proper and it's a dual footprint. Still, um, how, do we, how do we address that? Yeah, that, that's a, a great question. Um, we definitely have the information of who's you know licensed in the county versus who's licensed in the city. Um, it's not something that we have um, to put thought into at this point, but I would put it as something that we need to uh, put some thought to to figure out how to you know how do we accomplish that. Okay, so that would be one of my conditions. And my last question, Madam Chair, deals with I, I appreciate. You know, this, this is something I, I again, I just, I, I can sit back and observe because I've been here, done that. I, I've, I've raised a million three myself personally. I, I understand what it means to do, um, you know, and, and to be in this place. So here's my thought, which is we're, we're, what we're doing is, and I appreciate we're trying to help. Uh, and this is, it's, it's one thing to give a person a fish. It's another to teach them. All right. So that's the other side of me. Like, okay, but we're telling them where to go. But I think what's missing here is the academic part. I'm, 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 where's my Mercer? Like, okay, these people, I mean, why aren't these, I mean, it could be tied to a scholarship that says, okay, gosh, y'all need to retool. You need, there is something that I, I, I want to just plant to see. If I were doing this, education would be key. You need to go through this process, not just about the application, but you, you need a, a higher level of thinking. You need to revisit your business plan. You need to rethink this because everybody's not going to get this. So part of this is it, it should be conditional, which is, you know, if you've got 150, let's say it's a thousand people to apply, a thousand need to go through the process. To, to, and, and I get it's the speed of it. I, I get the speed that we're, we're just throwing fish. That's cool. We're giving fish. I ain't got no problem with that. But I want to teach you how to fish because, again, 
here's the chance for us all to reset, right? If there is an academic, if, if you want to really strengthen the population, and, and to the point, it's not about emotion. It's like, no, this is business. It's, it's, it's like, okay, guys, when you walk in there, are you really ready? Have you really thought through how you're going to come back with this thing, right? It's just not, okay, I got to pay my bills. It's like, okay, have you thought through? You are the renewer. This six and 10, you know, six feet and 10 people, and it ain't going nowhere. We, we got a lot of service business. So it's one of those where I would have liked to have seen the academic. I don't think we have to solve it now, but that's something that I'm, I, I will handle separately. Chris and Sarah, you both know I'm a strong proponent of entrepreneurship, but it has to be education based. Right. And, and so, again, fish versus, you know, giving a fish versus teaching a fish, I think it's something that um, uh, there is a difference. But I get the speed in which we're trying to do is really help. And so I commend you guys for bringing this forward. And it's not, to, it's just something for me to think about and for my peers to think about, okay, well, where's the academic part to ensure that, um, again, we can strengthen many more than just the ones who are going to qualify for this. So if, even if I don't get the, the grant, did the, did the commission, did the, the county do something that gave a greater good? Academics is free. Man, you can do these virtual online. I mean, I can teach a class that I just don't, I don't have time for that. But it's just one of those like, look, y'all can pull this off. Make the county better. Uh, by or, or the city proper by giving them an academic scholarship to allow them to be able to many people to be benefited but again everybody can't get the money i won't belabor it I, i've made my point i went a bit long madam chair i'm going to yield to the floor to my commission i'm done thank you we're good okay thank you so much any other comments from the board of commissioners uh anyone else yes ma'am okay commissioner guider mm -hmm. commissioner guider um Okay, first of all, uh, Congress may not be finished with what they're going to do. Uh, I think this may be premature uh, if they can get Speaker Pelosi back to the table. I think you may see a supplement to what they've already done as far as uh, the small businesses. Um, another thing, across the board, 5,000, you're talking about for a two- in employee business getting 5,000 and one that has how many, how, how far up, how many employees? 25, two to 25. Okay, 25 uh, business, um, 25 employee business getting the same amount that a two employee business gets. Is that right? Because you said 5,000 across the board. No, we, we we actually said we said up to five thousand. You know, we're trying to minimize the the subject the subjectivity in it. Um, it's one of the things that we have discussed um, internally. We had to, had the discussion on Friday. Um, uh, one of our committee members, Chandra and Pemberton, brought that point up um, about within the questions. Um, how do we structure it in the way that we do have tiers? Uh, but we just we we didn't settle on that just yet. Um. And as uh, uh, Commissioner Robinson alluded to, most of the businesses are in the city. And you're asking us to contribute 200000 and you haven't even talked to the city. Or, or they haven't committed to anything. So I have a problem there because uh, when we do, um, we do our service uh, what is it that we have to do every uh, five years, every 10 years, service delivery? SDF. I assure you, because most of the businesses are in the city, they get a bigger portion of the sales tax. <laughs> and uh, they, they get the um, business license from the, the, the businesses. We do not. And that's why uh, Commissioner Robinson was referring to the um, unincorporated area. Uh, that That's probably... I doubt that we, we do we have 25% in the unincorporated area? So um, I question you on that, and I question this process, but I also question whether you have the le legal authority to issue checks to people and loans to people. I, I don't know that you, you can do that. You are a bureaucratic branch of our government. You're not the government. So uh, maybe uh, Kenny Bernard, he's on the uh, conference call here. If he could weigh in on that, whether you have the ability to do this, um, 
with taxpaying money. Kenny, we lost him. <laughs> I, I'm here. And, okay. I, I, you, and not not in my mood. Not understand my mood what they were talking right. about. Yeah, you know, I, I think until the, the the devil's in the details about what the uh, actual administration is, I, I think whether or not governments can do X, Y, and Z depends on the whatever the final strategy. I think what they're laying out is kind of a uh, hybrid structure that's not been finalized, but my guess is the development authority with Joe Fowler over there and Sarah with her, her outside counsel and us and the city's lawyers, there's probably a way to do whatever they're trying to do. It's just a matter of getting it set up technically legal. The question before y'all right now is really one of politics and, and y'all's discretion about whether you're going to participate or not, but how they do it, sort of an in-game result. And any, any kind of contribution should be subject to it being finally legally approved, whatever the structure actually ends up being. And, and to that to that point, um, development authorities, the 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 way that we were created um, through the state were created for the means of um, conveying, you know, obviously one conveying the property tax component, but we also convey um, grants um, um, as well. And so we're 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 not we're not an entity of the county. We're a state um, entity. Um, I mean, however, our legislation is, you know, obviously we're, um, you, Ken, you probably know the better way to say this, but, you know, you all appoint our board members, but we are a state entity. Um, and so we're, we're looked at a little, little differently um, than solely just um, how the county does it. And I don't know the different, different ways, you know, and on all that, how that works. But um, for example, when, um, someone gets a discretionary grant, let's say from the state, those grant funds flow through the development authority because the development authorities are allowed to then convey those funds over um, on behalf you know, of the state. So um, that, that's kind of the closest example that I can give um, that what we have this, today. This just seems a little different to me and maybe it's just me, but this is taking tax dollars and you dispersing tax dollars our tax dollars that we collect from the people here in the county. Um, and maybe the legal people are going to have to see it that, um, work out the details. But right now, um, I think we need to wait and see. And, and the Chamber of Commerce, um, we give them thousands of dollars from the uh, hotel motel tax to operate. And... Um, I don't know if they can use hotel motel tax or whatever to apply to this, but the the Chamber of Commerce, we're all members and uh, you, the development authority is all members, the city's all members and everything. So we should be able to get a commitment from them before we commit. Um, they work with the businesses more than anybody. But first of all, I think we need to wait and see what the Democrats, if they come back to the table and the, the second half of the SBA uh, loan uh, package is will get passed. I think there's a probability it will be. Um, so I think we're putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. Um, and I'd like to see what the other people are going to commit before we commit, because most of the business are in the city. Um, and we give a lot of tax dollars to the uh, chamber to help them in their budget. I want to see what they, they are bringing to the table. And I really think the development authority <laughs> could bring more than a hundred thousand <laughs> because we give you 350, what? 350,000. And that's just from my memory. I can't remember exactly. But um, uh, I don't think you're going to help enough people with what you're talking about. Uh, you're going to make a lot of other people mad. If, it's, uh, if you can't accommodate all of them that did not get, have not already gotten the help through the SBA, then 
what do you do about the the people that fall through the cracks? Um, uh, I, I think this is just premature to bring this to this board at this time. And besides that, I feel like we're uh, having a rush on the bank, <laughs> a run on the bank here this morning. Everybody's wanting all this all this money, and we're we're really going to be talking about cutting, cutting. I hadn't heard anybody say anything about cutting yet. So um, we've got to wait and we've got to have our priorities. Uh, and I hope Mr. Corbin will uh, help us uh, along those lines. He, he can see the bigger picture and he's unbiased. He's, uh, uh, he's not playing politics. He just puts it bluntly. That's what I, <clears throat> that's what I like about him. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got allergies. <clears throat> With that, I'll yield back. Thank you so much, Commissioner um, Dider. Uh, this evening, again, I, I would like to just reiterate and stress that we will be talking about cutting finances this evening at 2 p.m. So that'll be our next topic of discussion. But I do what I do appreciate about the meeting today, everything is a comprehensive approach, so we won't have to keep coming back and forth. That was made very clear last Thursday, I believe, in our special call meeting. And I appreciate the Board of Commissioners for delaying the discussion I have a deep appreciation for it and respect for this today. So we could just bundle this package together and keep moving. I agree with you, Commissioner, uh, you, you know, about wanting to see what the other uh, entities are paying. I believe his request from us is $200,000. Uh, and at this time, uh, certainly would like, as I pivot to Mark, to see if we could roll that up in the in the, in the packet. But let me talk about some things that we are doing. I don't want to sit here and give the citizens an impression that we're just sitting here uh, taking our general fund and just uh, dubbing out money. Uh, we are doing some very aggressive things behind the scenes that we are, uh, we certainly are at the forefront of the Stimulus Care Act, uh, CARES Act uh, funding, which uh, will address uh, those um, counties with a population of under 500,000. So I just sent some information to Washington. We FedEx some information the other day, wanted to make sure that Douglas County is to, at the forefront. Also working with ACCG so we can make sure we get some funding. We are working uh, with FEMA. Uh, we feel that we will get some reimbursement, reimbursement from FEMA. Uh, Commissioner uh, Carthen mentioned HEROES Act. We are looking into that. We're, we have a stimulus package for our fire and EMS uh, department. Mark and Tiffany are working on that. The state support, I've requested $2 million from the state. Our senior and aging group, we have, a, uh, we have an ARC grant that's under, uh, under wraps right now. Dr. Gilcrest is working on that. So I'm just not sitting here doing nothing. Mark, if you could just talk about some of those things that Tiffany, I was trying to see if I could get on the line. Tell um, the Board of Commissioners what she's doing to push some of these grants through for us. Mark, if you could chime so in. You pretty much covered it, Madam Chair. Okay. So I know she's working under your direction, but can you tell us some of the things, for example, Friday, she did something Friday and we had to get this, uh, I believe we fed X uh, a package to Washington. Yeah, so Friday, that was the, that was the CARES Act for 500 uh, communities with 500,000 or more employees, I mean, uh, citizens, excuse me. Um, but we were getting, uh, emails late uh, Friday, it was after five, uh, from ACCG, they recommended that uh, everybody submit their packet. Um, so yeah, she, we did that last second. It was due at, uh, I think, 11.59 uh, Friday night, and we got that covered. Okay. So we are doing some things behind the scene, uh, Commissioner Guyton, and also you brought something to the forefront today about the SPLOST, perhaps, that could be utilized for uh, uh, supplies, masks, and PPEs for the fire department. So um, I'm so glad to have all our uh, brains at the table as we try to think through this um, emergent process. Very, um, with that being said, Mark, any other questions or comments from you, Chris and Sarah? Thank you for coming before us this morning. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just add, you know, to Commissioner Robinson's point, we did lay out there um, the, the, uh, the need to put technical resources in place. Um, looking at one existing programs that we have today, um, partnering with Mercer. So we did kind of lay that out in the process that, it, you know, it's not just if you don't get the funds, you need, even if you do get the funds, 
but just also presenting what resources there are available to support small businesses. Um, and, and we're working on some other things that um, were started prior to COVID-19 going into effect, going into place um, in the shelter in place um, that will uh, help boost up our entrepreneurial efforts, um, which is something that is a more of a long-term uh, focus of ours um, as well. Um, we will um, also, you know, be responsive and address um, the, the questions that were raised um, today as far as proportionality. Um, we will um, also look at where, um, you know, what others are able to contribute um, to, to the fund. Um, you know, it, it might be one of those where I think a lot of, you know, entities are looking at the same thing, you know, what, what is being contributed. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, at the beginning, um, more and more communities are putting together um, funds to support um, their local businesses. Um, and even with the SBA piece kind of going into play, um, there are a ton of needs. Um, we recognize that SBA may have another round, um, but we also recognize that there are still a number of businesses that are falling through the cracks. Um, and so um, we, you know, whatever that round might be, you know, there still are opportunities to serve um, our our local businesses and do whatever we can to um, keep afloat our local economy to to continue to have um, tax dollars generated in our community to come back into funding um, um, uh, the revenues that we're seeing shortfalls in. So it's really just doing our support. And one last point. I mean, Fulton County uh, just issued um, a fund um, last week. Um, they um, are, were committing a million and a half dollars from the Fulton County government, and I believe a million and a half from the Fulton County Development Authority. They're doing their program in the sh in the form of a loan fund. Um, it's a partnership with ACE, ACE. Um, they're partnering with ACE. They opened that fund just to just to talk about the need that's out there. That fund opened up on Thursday afternoon at three o'clock. It was shut down yesterday afternoon because they had already had an overwhelming number of applications of that program. So it is true that the need is there. Um, and as our the bankers on our board um, pointed out as well, there definitely is a need from local businesses despite of the SBA uh, program. So thank you all for your time and consideration um, uh, this morning. and. Um, or now this afternoon, and and uh, appreciate all that you do for our, our community and our organizations. Uh, Chris, before you go, this is Commissioner Carthen. I just I do have a, a couple of questions for you. Mm -hmm. Have you or Sarah Ray um, found out if there are any businesses that are on the brink of closure? Like, um, ha have you guys had a chance to get that information and compile that information. My second question for you is why the May 13th application date? Like what's what's the what, what got you to May May 13th? Um I'll I'll let Sarah answer the the business question. Yeah. Um, yes. So to answer your question, Com Commissioner Carthen, we have um had a three-part survey that we have sent out since um, COVID-19 became a, a, a thing. And we have data from over 300 businesses and, and it kind of goes through the last couple of weeks. And um, as far as what they're facing, how we can support them, you know, what resources they need. And in the most current version, which we launched about a week ago, it even asks, you know, what have you applied for? You know, if it was the SBA loan, if it was the triple P, you know, have you received that funding? Those kind of things. We are asking if people have had to lay off earlier in the game. It was, are you contemplating layoffs? And um, we went through each of those individual surveys and then worked with the Development Authority and Breezy Straighten, reached out to each of those companies that had clicked that button to say that they were facing layoffs to talk through that process with them. So I guess the long and short is that, yes, we have been compiling the data and responding as needed. I haven't heard of any specific business closings to date, um, just people that are sheltering in place and monitoring those those kind of needs. So we do have the data. Um, we made phone calls to all 650 of our um, chamber member businesses. So those are, you know, majority of those are included 
if we if we couldn't get them to take the survey, we've definitely got some of their information. And then just as I've been talking to people um, that aren't chamber members, which um, that's it's a large number of businesses, um, I've been kind of asking the same question. So we've been trying to capture that data, same thing, like in into our results. So so we do have some data, but I haven't heard of anybody that's officially closed their doors, at least not that I've been known. Of, uh, you know, that's been told to me. And, and to your, your question about the, the dates, it was really just a, a process of just kind of walking through um, timelines and our abilities to get um, um, uh, applications set up, uh, mailers designed and, and, and sent out. So really we're just kind of walking through a timeline of that and, think, and looking at May 13th kind of being the most logical date that we could get started. You know, that date could be, you know, May 18th, um, but you know we also didn't want to wait too long um, in the process as well. But we wanted to give ourselves enough time to get through approvals um, and get all the communications and materials out. Okay, and I just, I just oh, sorry. no, go ahead. I'm just. I'm going to add to what Chris um, had mentioned. Um, I'm, you know, I'm very appreciative of the board of commissioners. Um, Chairman Jackson Jones reached out to me at the, in the very early stages of when the SBA put out the EIDL loan information, and the the, the county actually sent out to all business license holders in the county a letter that was by myself and the chairman with the information on the SBA loan. And I guess, um, you know, as far as pushing out as far not not launching this until may 13th was i know just from those letters like i'm still receiving phone calls from people receiving those letters and we sent those probably four or five weeks ago so i think that to make sure that everybody has the information at their disposal it has to be at least a couple of weeks even just to get it through um the snail mail process because Again, you know, by the time some of those business owners were getting the information in the mail and and or being able to apply, one, there was new information that was already out that wasn't even on the information that we sent because things had moved so quickly. And there was there were new options. So I think that I completely support what Chris is saying that we need to give ourselves a little bit of a of, of a window to make sure that we can have all of those questions answered, have everything teed up to be able to make sure and that everybody can have that information shared. So that was just kind of a lesson learned on the backside from sending out those letters was that, you know, the, the mail doesn't always run in two days as it used to. <laughs> so just making sure everybody can have that information too. And that, that's understood. And, and um, Chris Pumphrey, could you also speak to, I know you said 750,000 is your goal, but if you don't get to that goal, are you still looking at going ahead and implementing this? Yeah, we, you know, that, that's a that's a great question. Um, we <laughs> still the need is still there. Um, we would like to provide as much as we possibly can, you know, for that. Um, and, you know, our initial, you know, kind of target was, you know, let's say five hundred thousand. Um, so, and that was kind of before we had the, the thought to looking at private, you know, business contribution as well. Um, and so, you know, if we if we got 400, you know, thousand publicly, um, and then another hundred thousand, you know, let's say between development authority and chamber or any combination thereof, you know, I, be I believe and would hope between county, city, chamber, development authority, we could hit the 500,000. Um, and then you throw a private sector on top of that, you know, a, a, a greater goal being the 750. Um, so if we fall short of the 500,000, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to evaluate that, but we wouldn't take funds and then decide not to go live. We would make that decision well ahead of that. Got you. And um, just for my um, other board of commissioners, it, this, this kind of affects us all, whether those businesses are in the city or in the county. Uh, if those businesses are not open, we don't get sales tax. We don't get sales tax, then we can't meet the service um, deliveries that we need for the county. So it, it really is, it's it's like, you know, we feed one so that we can get fed. And if we don't feed one, we don't get fed. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it really is this economic development life cycle uh, really affects us all. So um, I can't say that my colleagues will give you 200,000. I can't say they will give you 20,000. Of course, each one of us has a vote, but um, just, you know, we have to look at it in totality. Mm -hmm. um, we wish we didn't 
you know, have to be in this situation. But since we are in this situation, I think we should look at, you know, totally um, um, really considering this. And it, and it was part of the needs that I put in my resolution, Chris. So I was thinking about that. I was thinking about CSB. CSB was already in my, you know, in, in that. So um, again, um, no, we can't meet the needs of everybody. No, we can't stand up every business, but we are a community. And, and we are neighbors, right? And if we help each other, um, somewhere along the line, we will get help. So I'm hoping that we all consider this. But uh, with that, Madam Chair, I yield. Thank In you so much, Commissioner Carthen. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Commissioner Mitchell. Yes, yes, just, just, just one, and I'll, and I'll be brief. And thanks to uh, Sarah and Chris for providing this information. And, and I don't think I think all of us know that this is going to affect every business. This this COVID-19 touched everybody, everything, uh, every. Uh, it, it didn't it didn't uh, neglect itself from anybody. So everybody got touched by this. But the question though is, how do we how do we navigate this? How do we come back online as our economics come back online? And and how do we do this? I don't have the answer, but I, I, I'm asking my first question to you guys. Who came up with the $200,000 from the Board of Commission? Was this is a random number that we just came up with? That's my first question. Um, how do we come about this $200,000? Are we looking for the city to do $200,000? We're looking for the record to do $200,000? Are we just looking in general and hopes that we can kind of start with two and get to seven? Is that kind of the hopeful thought process in this? Yeah, great, great question, sir, and I appreciate your comments. Um, uh, as as I mentioned earlier, you know, to Commissioner Carthen, you know, we originally targeted, you know, a um, a five hundred thousand dollar, you know, fund, um, and you know, just trying to come up with some logical, um, you know, contribution amount. Um, my initial, you know, you know, was just kind of looking at a range, um, but you know, the request there is if you if you had a three part um, contribution, city, uh, Douglas County. City of Douglasville Development Authority, you know, we could logically get to, to $500,000. And that was really kind of the logic, um, you know, behind, you know, kind of putting it together um, and thus, you know, making the request. Um, if you just all decide to do something less than that, you know, we will, you know, we will do our best to work with, work with whatever contribution, you know, could be made. Um, but we believe that, you know, to optimize this and, um, you know, get out as much as we possibly can, you know, we would hope that 200000 would be contributed from the county. And I'm, I'm not saying that's a bad number. I'm just curious to know kind of where did it come from. And mm -hmm. then is that the same request from the city that we're asking? Uh, yes, so we've made, um, we, like I said, we haven't, this is our first formal request. My initial conversations have kind of been, um, I initially started um, with with Mark and, and Marsha, just kind of, here's what we're thinking as we're putting this together. Right. Um, right. But, but we'll make, you know, the same request, um, and we'll um, ask that of the council next week. Got it, and that's okay. And mm -hmm. I guess we've looked at, I mean, there are many grants that are out there. I know the SBA monies are all gone. <laughs> <laughs> so for those who, for those who got it, got it. For those who didn't, you know, wow. I'm I'm hoping that Congress and others uh, go back and try to revisit that. Uh, the triple P. I mean, so that the money that that goes out, it goes, it, it gets grabbed and kind of consumed pretty quickly. Are we really educating our local businesses? Like, okay, guys, this money's going to come, and you've got to be prepared. Here's the documentations, or here's the things that I think you'll need. I mean, so are we preparing? you know, the local businesses on how to capture the moment, because if not, they'll miss the moment. Yeah, and, and to, you know, and that piggy dovetails back into Sarah's point when they first sent out, you know, information to businesses about all the resources at the beginning, um, where we got uh, the business list from both city and county um, staff on all the businesses, their, their addresses and everything. Right. So we will start out with, you know, mailers and then you know, social media. We'd love to use Douglas County happenings. We love to use the city's, um, you know, means you all, you know, have your newsletters that go out to your constituents, use right. all of those things and do it in a manner that, you know, we're not, it's not going live the day that the, that the information is put out there. Right. We're giving everyone time right. to, you know, let it cycle through, let it cycle through the postal service, let it cycle through, you know, more Facebook shares and all those things so that when it does go live, we have 
we, we believe we've done our level best to reach everyone. Right. Um, and so that's the goal uh, with that. Okay, okay. Sarah? Um, I can also add to that, Commissioner Mitchell. Um, I know there's an, actually, there's a grant that goes live at three o'clock today through the U.S. Chamber Foundation. So I know we have as much heads up as we can get on our side, at least from a chamber perspective, as far as launching that information, we've been trying to be as proactive as we can. And as we've been talking to these businesses that aren't, you know, might not necessarily get our chamber information um, or have gotten it in the past, I've been making sure and adding them all to our communication. So, you know, we're, we're continuing to build out that pipeline um, of communication. But I know that with that grant specifically, we we went in and created our own marketing plan and on thursday the email went out to our membership we did a press release that hopefully went through the sentinel over the weekend um or today so we're trying to do it as much as we can and and luckily you know it's all i mean it's all okay it's still a chaotic world but i feel like you know especially with the eid alone like it was just thrown out there and you know everybody was scrambling to kind of try and figure it out. The same thing with the triple P. Right. So I think people are being smarter now, right. um, knowing and learning from the ready, ready, fire, aim approach, and that that just creates a lot more chaos. Um, and so people are being smarter. I know Facebook has a grant that's coming out in a couple of weeks, or no, by the end of this week. It's nothing our community is eligible for, but um, but they kind of had said, hey, we're putting this out. Stay tuned for more information. So I think that people are switching to this mentality because they they've seen how you know chaotic it can get on the backside. And the only other thing I'll add is that um, as far as creating a strategy for people to um, you know return into you know return to work um, as the president has communicated that and um and and you know help our businesses i keep saying that you know they're all you know they've gotten in this big hole and trying to dig their way out we are currently working on at the chamber um kind of strategies to help people one return to work and then two you know we have a sustainability program that we've had in place the last five years and kind of re-engineering that to be less of a sustainability program into more of a recovery program so we are working on those right now, um, just kind of waiting to see when we all and what um, returning to work will look like for our businesses. I know, I know. Well, listen, I mean, we can only try to be as proactive as we can and understand that this COVID-19 touched everybody, everybody. So uh, I can just only wish you the best and, and I get what the needs are. We just got to decide as a commission which direction we move in. So thank you guys again. Now you'll back, Madam Chair. All right, thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. All right, uh, Board of Commissioners, uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris and Sarah, for your presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move on to tab number four, and, and then from, from there I will uh, check with our um, county attorney to see if we no need to go into executive session. Tab number four is authorization. I'm sorry, tab number five is resolution to approve COVID-19 emergency response funding. Mark, um, I know you have the resolution before you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Carthen, for um, formulating um, this resolution in a comprehensive manner. I know I brought a hazardous um, pay for our staff for, the, for our special call meeting, and we had a conversation at that time. Let's just bundle everything together, take a comprehensive approach, and then we would just, and that would allow us to move forward because we, in this moment, we need to go right now, and to keep coming back and forth to the table makes no sense. I believe, and uh, I say this wholeheartedly, we're not Atlanta, but we are a moderate-sized county. And I believe that uh, what I, at the end of the day, when we all uh, rest our heads on a pillow, on our pillow, I want to make sure that we've done everything we can in our, uh, in our ability, in our capability, to support all the citizens of Douglas County and our employees through this moment. So that's very important to me. So, um, Mark, would you take over? Yes, ma'am. Um, hold on one second. Yeah, so the uh, resolution, the uh, way it's currently written, written um, is for allocation of $1.185 million um, for the purpose of providing emergency assistance pertaining to our community um, affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so the three categories, first responders and frontline hazard pay, 535000 
and that's based on uh, 552 employees that were confirmed with um, the department heads, um, I think last Thursday, Thursday or Friday. Uh, number two, community stability needs for seniors, youth, homeless, transient family, CSB, uh, utilization of businesses, 325,000. Uh, health stability needs, um, and that would include, but not be limited to, testing kits, um, site facilities, equipment, cleaning supplies and services, and that was 325000 Those add up to $1,185,000. Okay. Any questions from the board or any comments regarding this resolution? Yes, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. All right. So, <clears throat> I mean, I get the buckets, and I, and again, I like you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the Board of Commissioners recognizing, um, at least giving this consideration. Um, yes, we are a moderate size, and while we know there's a ten dollar need, and we've got a dollar, uh, we may only have a quarter to put on this, um, or even yet, we we may can put five on it. We need to do something, though. <clears throat> We, we, we have to take some action to, um, to, to acknowledge that we all we all have to give. It can't always be about extraction and taxation and, and all about us as administration. Yes, we will take care of the administration, but we only exist because of the public. We only exist because of the public. So, right, don't get me wrong, frontline, got you. First responders, got you. But there's a balancing act. And it, it, to, to not be so detached from the public in the sense that don't we see them? It's not about emotion. This is the business of the people. It is about dollars. It's always about the money. Always. So it's just one of those like, okay, but in this moment, I'm not going to make it an emotional argument. It's like, no, it's about money. And it's about who gets what and who doesn't. And so are, is there a consideration being done? So I appreciate backing up on this. This is a one time, you know, 100 years is on our watch. And the question becomes, in, in, in a moment of crisis, you're measured by your leadership. Can you rise to this moment? Right? They turn off the earphones. No, you don't have no advisors come in. You ain't got nobody spotting you points. You ain't got nobody scripting. Get, make a decision. Mm -hmm. Take position. And so on this one, um, I, as I look at the resolution, well done. I, I thought it was thoughtful. Thank you, Madam Chair, for, for at least allowing us to weigh in. We recognize that we, you know, our commitment was to give you what you needed. Let's, let's, let's get out the way. You got work to do, um, but we want to make sure that you're empowered properly and you, you don't have to come back and just like try to squeeze stuff out. Like, no, we get it. So I, I appreciate my peers for, for stepping up uh, and, and being able to frame this. So uh, obviously we're just appropriating. Uh, that, that's our role, like Congress, like the General Assembly, and it's up to the, the administration to figure out sort of the, the details in which we can concur with. So I think these buckets are appropriate. Two things as we blend this, as we bring it home. It says that, okay, and, and I'm okay with my peers weighing in and how you guys saw this, but based on the presentation I just heard, which is um, obviously small business and maybe kind of ministry, where would this fall at? I, I mean, I know it's not frontline, uh, the public safety guys, but which bucket did, would small business fall in based on this presentation, Mark? County ministry, would it fall? Hello? Mark? Sorry. That's okay. My microphone's off. That's all right. That's so all right. that would fall under number two, community stability needs. All right, community stability. And then um, obviously the CSB would be in bucket number one? No, it would be in bucket number two as well, oh. the way it's written. Uh, they both. Okay. All right. So you let me make sure if, I, if I'm doing this right. Um, so CSB was 100000 per month asked for the next three months. Um, the, 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 if we, and again, it's up to, we can we can cap this, guys. You know the language. It's up to, and it can be contingent upon um, everybody coming back and validating the details. In other words, I'm just trying to frame the buckets, but it's still going to have to validate this. So it's not like we're going to write the checks tomorrow if you approve this. It's just simply like, okay, if there's still some holes that you have. I think we just want to get the, the money out of the way. So, so then um, you, you've answered the question on that. 100,000 per month. That's 300,000. Uh, and then we just asked uh, up to 200,000 for obviously small business. Um, does that does that fit the 
or no? No, sir, not all of it. All right. So we need to smooth that out in my, my position. And so that's all I want to make sure is that if, in fact, we're considering what both presentations were given. And again, the whole point is I, I was uh, involved in like, no, you need to get before us now. There's no later. It, it's right now. So I was involved in both of those conversations last week. And it's like, no, you got to get before the full, full board uh, because they have a right to, to, to weigh in on this. Um, no, no backdoor deals, no committee meetings in front of the full board. So that being said, um, Madam Chair, I'm just going to yield. I made my two points. I just wanted to make sure, was that enough in there? And, and Madam Carthy or Commissioner Mitchell, y'all weigh in as well. I, I, I just like to know how we would fit in what we heard today. I yield. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair. Any other? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Guider. Yes. Um, it seems like the buckets already overflowed <laughs> and did in uh, category two. But uh, why do we have to have the categories when we've got this list um, by department? Why don't we just put the money in one bucket? And as the departments have to have something just related to the COVID-19 uh, virus, why wouldn't it just come out of the one bucket? Um, because right, right now we're already talking about one bucket's already spent if uh, the S the CSB is approved. So, um, but also uh, part of this resolution is the uh, hazard pay. Mark, would you please explain what the hazard pay is and who it was supposed to go to? Yes, ma'am. Because ma it didn't make sense last, last Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, so I talked to all department heads um, and elected officials that had submitted names, specific names. Um, so for the most part, it decreased and then it increased uh, for two departments, um, the clerk of court and the solicitor. But the total, um, so what we're looking at, what's proposed is $200 per pay period as hazard pay for all frontline employees. Frontline employees are those who come in direct contact with the public and are unable to do their job uh, while social distancing. Um, so okay. based on the number of employees, that's $118,846 per pay period. So we're looking at a little over eight pay periods, This, I mean, excuse me, four pay periods, which is eight weeks that is proposed. So the total cost would be $534,807. Uh, I know, um, I think Carroll County was doing theirs uh, this week. Um, a lot less employees, I think. But um, I'm looking at this list, and um, I don't understand. A lot of these people do not come in direct contact with the public. They're behind glass windows. And I do notice that the probate judge, his office is not on this list. And one of their their employees said, well, we're behind glass windows. We don't come in contact with them. Um, I don't understand a lot of these the people on this list. I know there's about three that don't have uh, done any work. Um, uh, well, one person is is already um, let go or, or, or left the county. And the other one just hasn't worked for him for since January. So, are you still vetting this list? Um, it's kind of a slap in the face of the first front, the frontline employees that actually come in contact, that work with the the people that are sick, or that transport the people that are sick, but. Um, when you're behind glass windows, I don't understand this. So what is the interpretation of personal contact? So there's a lot of people that work behind glass windows that are receiving payments. They're receiving debit cards, credit cards, um, paperwork. So, and all these are ways that can spread the COVID-19. That's why we have so, the hand yeah, tap sanitizer. We all go to the grocery store and we buy groceries and we pass money back and forth. 
we go to the pharmacist, we pass money back and forth. To me, that does not qualify. Now, if you're up front and you don't have a glass window in front of you, I can see that you uh, you are frontline. You are frontline employees. But this just seems like somebody said, oh, this is a good opportunity. But some people in the courthouse are not working in the courthouse. Some people, uh, the, 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 their departments are actually closed. And I don't understand just passing um, money back and forth when you can have hand, hand sanitizer between each person. But as far as the paperwork, good grief. Um, this has gotten way out of hand, uh, way out of hand. And it's a slap in the face for those that truly put their lives on uh, in jeopardy by being on the front line. I, I think a lot of these people got carried away. Uh, I thought you were going to vet it. I thought the yes, HR department was going to vet it. So but you, vet you're it. just so taking we, them at their word. You know, ma'am, I, I discussed it extensively with everybody on this list. Um, so which department are you saying is closed and they're not working? I'm saying they're behind, they're behind windows. They're not working with the public. They're behind windows doing good work. What about when the tag office, when those people come back and they start doing paperwork from all the dealers all around the country, are we going to pay them too? Uh, well, that'd be up to the board. Currently, we but didn't receive any They're not on this list. The yes, probate judge decided his employees were not in danger. So his, uh, because they're behind closed uh, glass window, he didn't submit anybody. You've That's got, correct. He didn't, you got he didn't the submit. Coroner, the coroner, he's, she's got four employees, but only one of them's been doing the work. And, yes, and that's those from be, her own reports. That would be worst case scenario on the four. Those would be prorated on the amount of work. Well, one has it worked since January, so that's not part of this this time period. And the other one was an office worker, and he's been gone. It says um, for about two or three weeks. So I don't understand that. Yes, and and so, then the coroner herself has not gone out on any of the calls. Her chief deputy's doing all the work. She's yeah, had so two, uh, two calls in, during this pay period, this time period that we're talking about, and they were to the hospitals where the hosp the doctors pronounced the death. So why are we paying? We're just giving people money just because they're asking for it. So, Commissioner Geyer, um if they have not worked from May 16th, or actually March 16th, excuse me, until now, they would not receive any hazard pay. But what if they haven't gone out on any calls or something? Then they would not or, receive Or they haven't come in contact with anybody. Then they would not receive hazard pay. But they're on this list. Yes, they are, because there is a possibility that they would in the next couple of weeks. This would extend all the way to the... May 2nd through 15th uh, pay period. <coughs> All right. Let me repeat this. Um, one of the deputies has not done work for the county since January, the end of January. We just got that report from the finance department. The chief deputy coroner is doing all of the work. He is making six to seven thousand dollars a month because he is doing all of the work. The coroner has answered two calls from hospitals. One of them was an inpatient that I don't even know why she went to that or, or even talked to the hospital about that. But the doctor pronounced those two. She didn't. She didn't come into any contact with any bodies. Um, and then the office manager or the office assistant part-time, he didn't, 
he didn't come in contact with any bodies. I don't understand, but I, he, I'm mean, the coroner. I'm not picking on just the coroner. I'm just giving them um, as an example. But even some of these office workers that are working behind the the uh, glass windows, just because they're handling paper, we all do that. We're all doing that. And I don't understand why this list got to be so long. Even I even question the dispatchers. They don't come in direct contact with the people. They're over the telephone. I know it's a stressful job, but I know they know it's a stressful job. But um, I just question this list in its entirety because we're just giving people money because I guess because we've got so much extra money laying around. I don't understand. But getting back to the buckets, I would suggest we just put have one bucket and then assign it uh, in accordance to the um, uh, department that it is uh, spent on. So with that, I yield back. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Geider. I certainly don't want to get in the weeds about the hazardous pay. However, uh, we followed the same uh, framework as a lot of our counterparts, such as Carroll County, which everybody speaks so highly of all the time. We utilize their framework, and, the, and, and they did approve their um, hazardous pay for their employees, and that information is public. There's a newspaper article out there. So it, it might have caught some of those one-offs that you have concerns about, and also Augusta, uh, is paying for the dispatchers. I said also not only frontline, but first responders, and our dispatchers are first responders. I thought we had worked out all the details last week. The information you have, again, is in the weeds. The board of commissioners are, will be appropriating a, a certain amount of money to allow me to provide uh, the support to our hazardous, uh, hazardous pay to our employees, and then also for our community service board, our businesses, all those things. So one bundle package. Uh, again, I, we're going to keep up with the money. I just need the approval to move forward. Uh, I know you looked at the list. Those two departments that Marks that he worked with, which is uh, the uh, solicitor's office and also our clerk of court, they've been mandated to work by Judge Melton, who's the state judge. So those offices could not close. There's a lot of traffic still coming in. The courthouse is the, I mean, the courts are the only areas that are not closed. So they still have a lot of traffic coming through. So you may want to question those two elected officials, but I had to take their word and listen to them. They got some, uh, not only does the solicitor, solicitor have people coming through her office, but she also has uh, investigators that go out to houses and homes. So we did scrutinize the list. Our, our uh, departments that Mark control, they did, we did minimize those and, and crunch some numbers, and then we were able to decrease those numbers significantly. Uh, but of course, we have two departments that you have a question mark on. We've talked to those two elected officials, and they said their staff is being exposed to COVID-19, potentially. So I don't want to try to apples to apples and oranges to oranges. We want to move forward, and I'm hoping that the Board of Commissioners will approve this appropriation request for me as we go forward. What do you do about the part that the uh, CSB has already surpassed the bucket that they come out of? Commissioner, I was going to ask Commissioner Carthen. I know she worked on the various buckets, and the one that says 325 will be utilized for health stability needs, such as testing kits, testing site facilities, equipment, and cleaning supply services. It may be an opportunity because we have all the testing kits. I serve on the Board of Health. I'm one of the Board of Directors for that. And we have a lot, we have plenty of money in the budget, as we've stated on numerous occasions, for our testing kits. So that may be an opportunity for me to shift some dollars uh, from that bucket. As Commissioner Robinson said, it'll be one large appropriation to give me some leverage so I can move back and forth, not to, because everything is, you know, it's 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 not set in stone. It would allow to give me some um, some leverage to move. Well, I, so I just suggest that it be by department rather than one bucket. And I yield back. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other concerns or questions from the Board of Commissioners about this resolution? Okay. Vice yes. Chairman Robson, you look like, okay, uh, Commissioner Mitchell, I see you. Okay, okay. 
I don't oh, see I'm you sorry. yet. I'm sorry. My apologies. Okay. Just, just a couple of questions. I, I, I kind of concur somewhat with Commissioner Guider. Um, my first question is, within the buckets, Mark, this may be a question for you or, or you, Madam Chair, within the buckets, are we saying there is going to be hazardous pay in the four buckets that I think uh, Ms. Carpen came up with? Yes. Yeah. Well, currently there's three buckets, first responders and frontline hazard pay, 535,000. Uh, community stability needs, which is for seniors, youth, homeless, transient families, CSB, uh, businesses, 325,000. Health stability needs, which is testing kits, facilities, equipment, cleaning supplies, services, 325,000 is currently what's proposed in this resolution. Right. Okay. Okay. And, and as um, always, my concern has always been, you know, not that they don't need it, or even deserve it is the hazardous pay versus the hazardous need. Um, I think we could, if we could stay away from what I call pay, uh, the pay and stay closer to the needs, the masks, the gloves, the, the, the kits, and, and, and all those items would be ideal, I think. And then we won't have to worry about something that, let me say, guys, because I've been doing a lot of research, and I know you, probably all the other commissioners have been doing the same, that this hazardous pay, we will not, we will not uh, get that those funds from any state, federal, or any type of fine grant or whatever. That will not come back to us. However, for all those that we do that help within the community of masks, that all of Douglas County get masks, uh, gloves, uh, kits to get tested, and so on, all of those items are definite uh, possibility of getting grants and being refunded. Um, and the list, speaking to what Commissioner Guider spoke of, the list is a little interesting, to say the least. And that's, I think, the concern of mine as well, is how do we take this list and, and, be, and be honest about it? I just, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with that side of it. Even though I've talked to a few that said, Preferably, I like to restructure my staff and how they operate versus taking on a hazardous pay that we will not get any refunds on this thing, guys. Just make sure we get it clear. Our budget is already struggling. Our budget is already, we're in trouble already. But yet still, we want to look at, I mean, any other addition to adding an expense or taking funds to this budget, it's going to be a problem. And I hope we all are ready to understand, uh, as I said this many years ago, when we did the 23%, at least I didn't agree with the 23% increase, that that's the only way out of this is gonna be now putting it back on the backs of the public and that would be with the military increase. I hope that's not where we're going with this. I hope that's not where we're going. But the list, I, I think we need to remove the list, take that bucket away and look at the needs as a needs assessment and go from there though. I'll yield, but I may have some other questions, but I'll, I'll yield at that point for right now. And I, I, I would love to hear from uh, I mean, Terenio to make sure that we are clear with the list of what we got in the buckets that we have though. So, but outside of that, I'll yield. Okay, thank you so Ma much. Yes, Madam Commissioner Chair. Carson, yes. Okay, so uh, one of the reasons that the resolution was crafted is because I was thinking about us going forward like what the plan would be and what we would need, right? So um, I understand the presentations that came before us today. Um, I kind of gave room for those, not not knowing that they would, but just kind of anticipating that they would. And it just so happens that, of course, they came. Uh, but we got to think about, as a county, what it will take to get us back to our operating state. So my request for uh, um, Director Teal, my request for you, Madam Chair, is to look at this in its totality. What will it take going forward, our plan going forward, to move us in the direction to open that courthouse back up? So when I say testing kits, I'm not just talking about testing for COVID-19. I'm talking about testing for antibodies. I'm talking about what a trace and treatment plan would look like. And I know you have to get with public health to do that, but not just public health, right? We just can't you know, put all our eggs in one basket for public health. That's why I asked 
uh, Ray Lightford about helping us with this. So also um, maybe having to uh, go with private labs in order for us to facilitate what our testing will look like. Um, so, so it's it's not just a, a, a just a testing for COVID nineteen. It's all of that because eventually we got to open this place back up so that we won't be in such um, um, a disarray, right? Again, I keep saying it. The only way that this government takes in dollars is through sales tax and through property tax. That's, those are our only two buckets, right? So that means we may have to cut services. We may have to cut employees. I hope we don't. I, I you know, I, I would hope that's not what we have to anticipate doing. However, we may just need to look at what comes back from the finance committee and see where we will cut and what we can give to. If our cap is a million dollars, if the finance committee comes back and says, look, Douglas County, you all may not get any money back from FEMA or the grants or, or, or ARC or, or any of that, this is what it will look like for you to take a hit, right? So we need to look at if we can even do any of it. But this is the proposal that's on the plate. When the Finance Committee comes back and gives us hopefully their, their committee um, a recommendation tomorrow, then I, I'm assuming that you, Chairman Jones, and you, um, Director Teal, will be able to say, okay, this is what y'all gave us to do, this is what we can realistically do, and now we can move forward. So. Uh, that's what I have to say about that. It, 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 it is appropriation, but it's also within, um, you know, within bounds, realistically, because we don't have a lot of money. We, 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 we know that we are going to take a hit, right? The government, um, the state government has already said we're going to take a hit. What they can even appropriate to us is going to take a hit because they're taking a hit on a, on a state level. So uh, everybody's taking a hit. So we know that we have to appropriate accordingly. We have to be conservative. Again, um, I don't spend my own money haphazardly, so I'm not going to spend the county's money haphazardly. I'm very conservative. Y'all know I drive the same car. My car is as old as my children, 20 and 18 years old. My cars are old. Even though I could go out and buy another car, I won't, right? So even though we can do certain things, we need to realistically look at, is it necessary? And how do we accomplish it? And in what means, and, and um, when I say means, appropriating means to accomplish those goals. So with that, Madam Chair, I yield. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Tomorrow, uh, this evening at two o'clock, something that you just stated regarding the how we're going to reopen. I will be addressed in testing, tracing, and treatment, and also as we trans uh, transition back into the workforce. So that was that's listed on a document that I provided to the uh, to our finance committee. So we'll I have a little grid that's out there. I call it a worksheet. Some of those things that will incorporate uh, uh, maneuvering back into opening uh, Douglas County up. So those things are under consideration, but I appreciate you uh, mentioning those items. Um, again, the hazardous pay, as, as it was my impression today when we come, when we, um, the reason why we deferred the meeting on Wednesday is so we could talk about adding hazardous pay into the litany of things that had been presented already with the resolution. And that's what I was under the impression. And I'm hoping that uh, still stands, certainly because Mark has had an opportunity to integrate that in our resolution uh, for that hazardous pay. Uh, do we agree on every person that's in there? But it's two areas, uh, Commissioner. Again, like I said, I could be willing to bring those two uh, elected officials to both of our offices and you can question them one by one, but we've taken the time to do that. They said they feel that their employees are exposed. So I didn't want to just keep challenging, but I would certainly go back to the table and do that. The other, uh, the first responders are primarily, if you look at the list, they're primarily first responders. So um, again, that was my impression today when we came back that we would just include hazardous pay and make this whole thing comprehensive, not just now all of a sudden uh, we want to just remove hazardous pay. That's that. That's not what I was. Uh, my impression uh, when we left our meeting on Wednesday. So, with that being said, um, Mark Teal, are you finished with your presentation? Are you complete? Okay. Uh, any other yes, comments? Sir. And I'm gonna move on to the next item. All right. Um, I don't think we have the capability to go into executive session at this point, do we? From a virtual standpoint, um, county administrator, before I even call. 
Okay, so Madam Chair, here's what we're going to do. So everybody needs to, first commissioners go, you need to keep your computers up, keep Microsoft Teams on. So once you go out of into executive session through this meeting, uh, Jessica and I are gonna start calling everybody into executive session. So you'll get a phone call on your screen at the end of executive session, we're gonna bring TJ online uh, and then we will stream the uh, remainder of the Board of Commissioners meeting, just like we always do. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> Attorney Bernard, do you, we need to go into executive session? Yes, ma'am, we need to go into executive session for litigation and real estate. Okay. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So move. Madam Chair? Mm-hmm. Yep, you, you got a motion, so I gotta wait. Okay. Second. Okay, okay we have a second. Any discussion? We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, please uh, indicate and state your name by saying yes. Or Chairman Jones, yes. Henry Mitchell, yes. Terenia Carson, yes. yes. Ann Jones Guider, yes. And Kelly Robinson, I believe you said yes to, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. All right. So, um, Madam I Chair, guess, point yes. of order before you, you, you close this and shift, can I ask a question? Absolutely. All right. I, I got cut off for whatever reason technologically, so I, I, I missed part of Madam Carthen's um, um, articulation, but I, I, I caught um, her passion at the end. So uh, how, how do we close this out um, in that we want to resolve it? Is it what, we, what, what is your what is your request? You want to finalize this in committee and come back tomorrow with the final um, and take everybody's consideration? I mean, what is the, the takeaway? How did you lead it? I'm sorry. I just I have to ask. Commissioner Carthen. Yes, um, I think it would be best that we totally look at the finances. I think Commissioner Guider has made that point, Commissioner Mitchell. I think we all need to really know what the numbers are. So yep. I would love it if we could get a recommendation from the Finance Committee as to what that total amount will be so yep. that Chairman Jones and uh, Director Till can um, do what they need to do in order to move us along. Got it. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm clear. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. All right. So we'll wait on our phone calls. Mark, is that what we need to do? He's having a phone call. <laughs> yeah. Madam, Madam Chair, I think he, we're going to hang up and y'all stand by on your, phone, on your computers and you'll get a call back. Okay. okay. Thank you. So everybody drop off. Okay. Everybody hang up. Yes, sir. Just. I don't want to hang up. <laughs> All right, thank you. We, we will resume our work session. Uh, Commissioner Carton, I believe you had a question for us uh, before I end the meeting. Yes, my question was for Attorney Bernard in regards to hazard pay. We don't have a hazard pay ordinance, and I know that we did have um, a 2009 flood. So I was wondering how did we handle hazard pay during that event? And do we need to have a hazardous pay ordinance in order to ensure that we are in compliance with asking um, for these funds possibly back? So I can answer that, Commissioner okay. Carthen. So we have never paid hazard pay, um, not to my knowledge. And so from talking with Jason Milhan and Jima and FEMA, as far as getting reimbursed, um, the current situation is if we issue hazard pay, we cannot be reimbursed because we did not have a hazard pay ordinance in place um, when the emergency declaration was made. So you, can't, you can't do it after the fact. Um, That's correct. Okay. No not have a hazard pay ordinance and we've never issued hazard pay. This is the first time it's ever come up. So it would be my recommendation then that we get one in place. Uh, this hopefully will be the last hazard that we ever have, but just in yeah. case, we as a county we'll definitely need to, need to have that 
have that in, in place. So we know that given these uh, $532,000, we won't be reimbursed for this. So uh, we want to make sure that we make that clear to uh, to the um, to the public and to every commissioner on this call um, in, in regards to that. And, and so with that being said, I would hope that uh, Chairman Jones and, and you, Mark, would go back and really, again, look at who needs to get it. Because I think a, a lot of the counties that I have been looking at, that I looked at over the weekend, they really only gave it to the first responders, the sheriffs, and, uh, and a couple of the, um, the crew um, um, engineers, um, not engineers, um, landfill workers. Um, so I can't tell you who is or who isn't being impacted by it, but if we can give those departments who feel like they really need something, if we could give them, I don't know, to, you know, um, the necessary masks, necessary gloves, necessary um, hand sanitizer, those things to help mitigate their exposure to it, I think would be better. We just want to make sure that, you know, again, we, we don't have unlimited funds. So um, hopefully this number can come down. Uh, again, we will await to see what the Finance Committee comes back with. And um, hopefully that will, you know, help us to make a decision, an informed decision tomorrow uh, in regards to the hazard pay, the community service needs, and the health needs for the county. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield. Thank you so much, yep. Commissioner Carter. Madam Chair. Yes. Chair, so Jason Milhon and uh, Chief Spencer, they've been working with, with GEMA and all different agencies on getting any kind of suits, gloves, M95 masks, um, face, you know, face shields, um, and we're having trouble supplying enough just for public safety right now. Um, so those would be the first ones on the list. Right, right. Uh, let me just add also, Mark, to the 500 and whatever the number, 535,000. We said that all of that would not hit the general fund. Is that what you said you had the other day? You carved out the various areas, such as the landfill, which is the enterprise fund. I know it's all it's all potatoes, potatoes. I see your yes, head. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. So 425,000 would be for the general fund, the unique fund, $6,782, enterprise fund, 4,847 E911 fund, uh, 31,973 fire EMS fund, 64,913 and animal control fund, 1,940. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we didn't forget, lose sight of that. Those uh, various buckets that we already looked at in advance, uh, certainly because that five, 35 just it, it, it raises everybody's eyebrows. So I just wanted to make sure we had that discussion as well. Okay, Board of Commissioners, if there's nothing else to come before us, uh, certainly um, this meeting is adjourned. And thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Right.